Good evening. Afternoon to all of you guys. Let me turn me up just a little bit. Can you guys hear me okay? You guys are good to go? All right, let me make sure I can see everybody out there. Wow. Okay. Let me go back here. Okay, stand by, you guys. Let me get this uh, right here for myself. Okay, today we have another Q&A with Revelation. And, but, we're going to go back to our question we had yesterday. But before I do that, one of the biggest things people are dealing with right now in the USA are fires again. And no wonder I've been stuck on fires for a while now. Just to let you know, most of those places in Texas, well, actually in the southern half of the USA, is they're about to, uh, they're going to have to issue or operate under red flag conditions. They're going to have to, due to a lack of moisture. And the intense temperatures have not started yet and cause humidity to really drop. They haven't started yet. A lot of people have lost everything. Of course, insurance covers new homes and everything, but not debris removal, right? California has been blessed in, in certain areas of California that once burned. Uh, they've been inundated with water. However, when the, as these temperatures begin to change, and patterns change, I don't believe that uh, people are quite prepared for fire. I don't believe they are, not not uh, not for the sheer amount, or let's say potential fires that can be out there. Plus, plus we have a different problem. We also have people who want retribution. You know what? Ever since uh, well, just today, a few cautions were issued from the intelligence community, and it appears to be. Uh, almost an instant rise in groups talking about some type of retribution towards the USA. In, in normal cases, they can look into such things and, and stop it. In this case, uh, it's very different. It's almost like they have caught on to certain procedures that uh, the USA has concerning terrorism. And so in this case, it's going to be far different than any other case. The reason being, there are lots of people within the USA who have been, they have been disgusted by what has happened in the Middle East. But they're not in favor of Israel. In fact, support for Israel is dropping daily. The UK and Europe, is, they're, they're having a super problem with, um, uh, a big problem with those who, have a severe hatred for the Jews. Somebody says direct energy weapon calls fires Maui in Texas. I personally I don't think so. I really don't think so. And we're gonna see that this year. First of all, Texas is the last place any government would ever want to hit that's an international landmass. Hope you guys know that, which is why the Texas governor can get away with quite a bit. But Right, but the entire world depends upon Texas, just in case you guys did not know. If anything ever happens to Texas, it's going to be game over. It's a hub for more than you know. And so nobody's going to attack Texas or nobody's going to hit Texas with anything, despite any of the domestic issues or uh, problems with borders, anything like that. They're not going to do that. They will not do that. They won't do that. Texas is instrumental for the continuation of the USA. And a lot of people don't know that. And then strategically, Texas is critical for all U.S. operations, for all NATO operations. 
Remember that. Remember that. And we have a defense net over the top of that that is specifically assigned to Texas, right? There are technologies that are being used that no one is ever going to discuss because they don't know it exists. Texas is heavily guarded, heavily guarded. I'll say it again. Most people are involved in a game they know nothing about, right? They're fully engaged in social affairs. Social affairs have been socially engineered. Let me ask you guys something. Why has no president built a wall? Not one, not two, no president has built a wall. Why? Why has every president, including Trump, failed to build a wall? Let's look at the, let's look at the real picture. Did Trump build a wall? He said he was going to, he wanted to, but he was stopped cold in his tracks. Correct? Did any other president build a wall? No, they did not. They built portions of a wall, and anybody who's been down there, they know that there's, that there are huge gaps in that wall. Right? No president, not one, has built a wall. Why? Why? And do you guys know where most the dangerous illegal immigrants come from. If you think it's Texas, you've messed up. You need to go back and do your do a little more homework on the East Coast. Do a bit more homework with Canada. Do a bit more, and you'll find out. All they have to do is not cover something, and people they. It does not exist in their minds. If a report came out that 110 cargo containers, air-conditioned cargo containers, were shipped to the middle, central USA, and when they were released, they were found full of people, if that story were to ever be printed, that would change everything, correct? But it's not been printed. You don't hear of reports like that. In fact, you don't hear of any reports of anything concerning what comes in on the coastlines. Right? As Christians, try not to play the game. Try to look at everything so that you're never caught and blindsided by the game. If you play the game, you're going to be emotionally disrupted. You will become angry. You'll begin to operate by the same spirit the world operates by. Your peace will be disturbed. And you'll act in accordance to worldly things, not godly things. Wouldn't that be the whole point? In the Bible, if you're not covered by the blood of the Lamb, you're an operative of the prince of the air. There's no in-between. All those who are not covered by the blood of the Lamb are operatives of Satan himself. Now look at your leadership and ask a question. Are they doing godly things or ungodly things? And then look at the fruit of it. Look at the fruit. Look at the fruit of what's being produced. Is it godly or ungodly? I'll tell you right now, my stock is not in people. People have a job to do in leadership. They do. They do. I look at the job, not the person. I know the people. So I look at the job. Only the job. Right? Only the job. Not looking at the people. People are people. They are. But every single kingdom in this world is about to be toppled by the everlasting kingdom. How about that? The everlasting kingdom is coming in. And there will be not one kingdom on this earth that will be standing. A new Jerusalem will come in. Everything old is going to go away. And the process has already begun. If your faith and hope is in people, you're going to be sorely upset. Just letting you know that. Hmm? Just letting you know that. Somebody says, what about the 500 miles of Walt? Well, that's a, that was printed. That's not what it is. That was printed. Just, just get down to them. In fact, people wouldn't like the facts. Right? They wouldn't. Oh, first of all, just to let you know this, again, no president has succeeded in doing that. And do you not know that the new walls replaced the walls that were there previously? 
Somebody tore down the other walls. You remember, guys? Remember the two precedents in which much of that wall came down? You remember that? Anybody? Anybody? My point is, it would take, do you know how much of a wall it would take to complete the border? Do you guys know? Anybody know? <clears throat> the problem is not really the people sneaking in on the border, because I can tell you this, thousands come in by the coast on a daily basis. The winter months are the months when you can really tackle the East Coast. In the summer times, you're looking at probably, I would say, more than a million would come in on the East Coast every single year. Every year on the East Coast. Not the southern border, the East Coast. Just so you understand that. There are probably another 300,000 that come in by Canada every single year. Every year. See, nobody's looking at those things. Everybody's looking at what the media is pointing them to because they use it as a vice to gain things, right? The truth is this. Even if we had a wall 500 feet tall at the southern border, we're going to have a problem with immigration. We're going to have a problem with false. There are a lot of false documented people who have come into this country. And then three years later, you find out the documentation was not vetted correctly. It was falsified. Governments do, these governments out there do, they do support false documentation. If they can get you to trust the paperwork, you're done for. That's one thing the intelligence community will not do. They don't trust anybody's t uh, paperwork because they understand they're corrupt governments. You're dealing with corrupt people all over the place. The problems are not going to go away until Christ returns. But we have a bigger problem, and it's not immigration. You're going to find that out quickly. Satan has a tactic, right? And so I'll tell you this. Whatever the world is looking at is not the problem. It's not the problem. Whatever can be seen has never been the thing that has really gotten the people. It's what you cannot see, and it's what you're not thinking about. That's the biggest problem. The biggest one. They have reasons they don't print crime reports like they used to. Domestic murder, domestic murder, right? It's up too high. It's almost like the citizens of America are losing it. And they're turning into murderers. And they're being overtaken by hatred. We're talking about folks who were born here in this country. We're talking about folks who have parents that were born here in this country. Not the illegal immigrants. No, no, no. So we have something else happening. People are becoming highly aggressive. And it's going to get a lot worse. A whole lot worse. But don't worry. What the Lord wrote in Revelation is certainly going to come true. And when it does, people are going to get angrier and angrier. Note in Revelation that people blamed everything that happened on the living God. All right? Satan's mindset, our father will never do this. Satan does this. Satan will always have you point your finger to blame someone for something not happening good in your life. You know that, don't you? He will always give you a target. God teaches all of us never to have a target. Never to have a target. Targets are unnecessary. It is Satan who will give you a target. Now listen to me. That means any person, even any of you, at any time, when you pointed at someone and made that person a target, you were not operating under the Holy Spirit. You were operating under the guise of the flesh. That's what you were operating by. Because your father does not do that. Your father clearly said to love your enemies. Not point your finger at your enemies, have a conversation, and have a thousand other people to do the same. Didn't do that. But don't worry. People are going to be sick soon enough. When the truth comes out, I'm going to cushion the blow. When a multitude of truth comes forward, right? 
Don't blame yourself for not seeing it. Don't blame yourself. Because to be frank with you, at some point, everybody has fallen for something, right? Everybody has. You've fallen for something. It'd be nice if uh, these illegal things were killing were the true destroyers of us, but they're not. They're not. In fact, we should host a project that would prove that. I think that would change people's minds, but we would be hated of everybody out there. We would. How many of you think that drugs are the number one killer in the USA? How many? Like overdoses, you know, eventually drugs or something like that. How many of you think it's the number one killer? How many of you think it's, it's if you went from a scale to one to ten, what number would you, would you think that drugs are at for killing people? For really disrupting people? What number would you say? Five, eight, nine, ten, one. What would you say? Anybody? What would you say? Somebody says zero. You don't think. Well, drugs do. They do play a role in the death of many people. They do. But it's not the highest. It's, it's not even close to the highest. Okay? Somebody said abortion, abortion, yeah, that, that takes, you know, the newborns, but it's, it's quite low. It's, it's very low. It's extremely low. You'd be shocked at what one of the number one killers are. Now, can, can it be proved what the number one killer is? It could if you dig into the numbers. But nobody, listen, nobody's just going to offer those numbers to you. They're not. But you'd be shocked. You would. Drugs just doesn't measure up. It doesn't measure up. There are more people dying by something else than drugs, right? And by, by the way, what would happen if nobody wanted drugs? If nobody wanted drugs? Well, I think drug sales would be out the window, right? If nobody wants drugs, nobody would be buying that killer stuff, right? Isn't that correct? Okay, hope somebody's getting close to it. Somebody's getting close. Somebody says medical malpractice, right? As, as kind of close, kind of close, not quite there, but it's kind of close. But think about something. If nobody wanted drugs, if nobody wanted drugs in the USA, which wouldn't happen, but if nobody wanted drugs, that would kind of stop a lot of the crime pertaining to drugs, right? The problem is this. See, we stopped drug sales today. We stopped it. No more people coming across the border. Well, we still have a high death rate. Or would it go down? If, if nobody else came through the border and we got everybody who ever did any illegal activity in the United States and put them out of the country who were involved in murder and drugs and stealing and all that stuff, would the crime rate decrease or increase? Here it comes. It would increase. It would increase. Oh, so we got a problem. What about drinking? What about that? Alcohol. Alcohol is far higher than drugs. And not, not people who, uh, who are alcoholics. No, 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 no. No. See, this was dug into, and a few people got in trouble with this report. Think about something. All those folks out there working, they have a hard day, and they go get a couple of drinks. They want to have a party. Every time they get off work, they want to have a party. Good people, they host their friends and everything else. They want to have a party, right? Everybody starts drinking at the party. There are going to be a number of those people who are involved in domestic dispute, disputes, right? which leads to death in a big way. Some of those people are going to be drunk drivers, which leads to death in a big way. Some of those people are going to be in accidents, which leads to death in a big way. So what's a driver? Here's a driver, people who want to have a good time. Good people who want to have a good time, right? 
good people who want to have a good time, they go buy alcohol. Alcohol sales are up there so far, right? And people go get the alcohol and start doing all sorts of things. They throw caution to the wind. They have a big party. I'll say it again. They have a big party. That's one side of the issue is that everybody wants to have a big party. The next one is compensation. You go to work. You're a good guy. You have a hard day at work, right? You have a hard day at work. So you go get a couple of drinks because you had a hard day at work. So you're compensating for social failures or any type of failure. When they were viewed, those who were in accidents that end up in death, those who had accidents, those who had alcohol-related domestic disputes that ended in death, oh, my goodness, the numbers are shocking every single day and with violence and tension and everything else rising it's starting to hit an all-time high it's outweighing everything and the driver of this is that people compete with what listen they're willing to kill each other to position themselves so they don't have to worry and when they do worry they go get a compensator it'd be nice if it were illegal drugs that is a problem. That's a big problem. But we have bigger problems. The bigger problems always involve those who are doing legal activities. Well, you have a whole nation that wants to have a party. When you have media that simply entertains people, and everybody wants to be entertained, and everybody wants their life trouble-free, and they want to be entertained, and everybody wants money, and they want to be entertained, they tend to recreate that environment. Look at yourselves, right? Why do people work so hard? It surely is not to help their neighbor. It's so that they can relax, correct? Isn't that correct? Right? Big Pharma is pushing legal prescriptions with people with legitimate problems, right? They get stuck on a cycle. Good people. You'd be shocked. They take a Percocet or something like that because they were in an accident. They have a bad back problem. They take it for the pain in their back first. Over about an eight-month period after a few refills, right, their back is not hurting as much. But now they can't deal with the social pressure. Once you walk away from the world and you take a break from the world and go back to the world again, it's very difficult to deal with the world. It is. Most of you who believe in Christ, you know how difficult the world can be. And the truth be told, it's very difficult to deal with the world and to maintain your civility all the time. There is a diverse set of people out there, right? They, will, they can push buttons on you you never thought you had, correct? And so when people start down this medication road, they're not trying to get addicted to anything. It's not what they're doing. They get the medicine actually starts to change how their body functions and how they process information, right? So it becomes a stress reliever and they can't function without the medication in a social setting. They can't do it. And so they get stuck or they can't deal with it. They just can't deal with it. So it would be nice if illegal activities were the number one driver of death in this country, but it's not. It really isn't. It turns illegal, naturally, right? When a good person drinks too much and they go hit a family, right? When a good per when somebody has a domestic dispute because they have drank too much and things went too far, it's terrible. And the driver of that is comfort. Everybody is seeking comfort. And some people are willing to do whatever it takes to make sure they have their comfort. Is that going to get any better? No, it's getting worse and worse and worse because now the real problems come. The destruction of crops, the decimation of property. Fires are going to eat the USA up. People are going to be compressed or moved out of certain regions into other regions. Insurance companies are going to be overwhelmed. Already, many insurance companies do not cover floods. People in Florida have found that out. A 
be found then out. So we have a problem that is both systemic and growing every single day. In the meanwhile, we have external drivers like politics, right? Politicians are trained to amplify a subject by any means necessary to persuade the people to support them. Now, no, I don't believe politicians start out rotten. I don't believe that. I believe they start out good. I do. They, they, have, they have a good mind to do politics to help people. But here's the process of which people fall. They're in politics. They're making about, you know, 70, maybe $100,000 a year or something like that. Right? Good income, decent income, not rich or anything. But then the lobbyists come. And they talk to the politicians and they say, hey, if you can get this law passed right here, if you can do this, we'll go ahead and give you some cutbacks from it. Right? Oh, and we'll help that school over there and that school over there and that school over there. Right? So they say, hey, that sounds good to me. So they pass that law. And that corporation comes back and they say, hey, we have this thing. And if you could just work with us one more time, we'll host a dinner for you at $5,000 a head. And you'll get all those proceeds. Well, who wouldn't do that? Right? Sounds good. Sounds good. So they come in and do that stuff. They start lobbying, doing all this stuff. All of a sudden, people end up rich. A person with a $70,000, 70 to $100,000 paycheck ends up with a $2 million home, lots of stocks and everything else. They end up rich. They get a taste of what it is to be really secured by riches. They don't want to give it up. They don't. They have anything they want. People are knocking, you know, calling on the phone all the time trying to give them money. Trying to give them money. And all they have to do is vote for or against something. Right? That's something. So everything gets corrupted from having too many comforts. Once you get to a comfort level, it's very difficult to give that up. It's very difficult to give that up. If that were the case, everybody with a car that's like 2023 should go and sell it and go get a 2019 car. What I'm telling you is that we get used to a lifestyle. And it becomes part of us. And we're not willing to give it up. And we want to take care of it. Right? We want to take care of it. So when that happens, it's very difficult to back down. We have the whole world doing that. It's inevitable. You're going to have plenty of fights and everything else. Hmm? Plenty of fights. That's us. And every other nation, you know what they say about Americans? They do. They say we're spoiled, especially those who suffer. There are nations out there, people are suffering, but they smile. They're good with their families and everything else they are. You, you start coming to America and, and we are spoiled. We're not really thankful either. And we have something to complain about on a daily basis. We do. And conditions are beginning to degrade beyond the control of anybody. The Lord's not going to continue to allow this, you know, to allow us, Christians, to be greatly affected by this. When the Christians begin to fall away from their faith, it's game over. God intervenes, and that's precisely what's happening. You are the alarm clock. You are one of the greatest signs in the Bible. You are. When the world begins to get to you, when you start agreeing with the world too much, the Father does not want to lose you, does he? He didn't want to lose any of us. So if you didn't want to lose a bunch of people, to the vices around them, what would you do? You would intervene. That's what you would do. God's intervention is the closure of this entire process called revelation. And so we live in times that are changing drastically. Because now Christians and their mindsets are being affected. You have more Christians now who believe in worldly systems than ever before. They're not separated from the world. They're tightly knit with the world. They're starting to say nothing is wrong with the world. Nothing is wrong with, you know, this person over here doing this. Nothing is wrong with all of the politicians and that. That's a no-go. Would Jesus approve of these politicians? Would he pull one into the kingdom of God? Here's the truth. Anybody who does not know these people personally, you can't. The only thing you know is what they presented. You don't know. You just don't know, right? 
How many people think I stink? How many folks think I stink? You can answer it. Don't worry. Nobody thinks I stink? Like, smelly, in the nostrils, smell bad. How many people think I have a body odor? You know what the answer is? You have no idea. You have no idea. You have no idea. So you cannot say, Mike is a you know, it's pretty squared away fella. Smells good too. You can't say that. You can't say that. You don't know what I smell like. Right? You don't know. And I'm telling you that there are people out there in the world. They present things to you. You don't know what they truly are. You don't know what they truly are. They have a different conversation outside of the microphones than they do with the world. I'm telling you what I know for real. It's rare to find someone who is truly the person they have presented. By the way, they want to be reelected. They want to be supported. Why would they show you? who they really are. No. They're going to show you exactly what you want to see. They're going to show you precisely what you want to see. They're going to talk about those things that will bolster you, things that you talk about, right? If no person talked on social media, these politicians would be lost. They wouldn't know what you approve of or what you don't approve of. If you take note, they're always watching numbers. Oh, they like that comment. Let me go that direction. Oh, they like that comment. Let me go that direction. You have people doing that in organizations too. I refuse to do that. That's why I don't use social media. I have to be free and clear, right? I'm not going to talk by numbers. I'm not going to talk about something that everybody gets a bunch of likes on. I can't do it. Well, I'm proof of that. I don't do that. That's how they do. So be careful this year around. You know, it's almost like a plea from my heart directly to you. Be careful this time around. I'm telling you right now, there, there's, there, it, this could be one of those times where you cannot take back. You can't take back what you have put into these folks. And everything you do, if you support someone who's going to end up killing everybody else, then you supported them. And if you ask, well, how did I know what they were going to do? That's why you should have consulted your father in heaven. That's why you've got to be careful of what you hear. If you're convinced by what you have heard, and you have no, you had, see, because here's the truth. Here's the truth. Naturally, Christians do not like politicians. So what made a person like a politician in the first place? The clear answer is you got that from somebody else. When somebody you know or trust likes someone, you're more prone to like them. You like people because of the people you like. And what I mean by that is... If I like all of you, anybody out there who highly respects me, if, if you respected me, you really somewhat trusted me, and I really liked a person, right? You may give that person a chance for yourselves. That's what I mean. You might like someone through somebody else. You may. I don't do that. I can't do that. That's not the sermon. That's being persuaded by weight of evidence, by something presented to you. I have to have internal confirmation from up above directly to me because I found that never to lie. I found presentations to lie all the time. All the time. I can't do that. With all the tyrants that have been in the world, Saddam Hussein, I wonder how many people looked at him and said, oh, I want to help him out. He's a good guy. I wonder how many people said the same thing. 
Well, a lot of people loved Hitler. They did. People loved these tyrants. They did. Why did they love them? Because the people they respected liked them or appeared to have liked them. And that bolsters support. What I'm asking you to do, start operating by kingdom discernment, not evidence discernment, not hearing discernment. And certainly not by what you see. The Lord knows who everybody is. And he's not going to withhold from you who somebody is. Now, what could blur your vision in seeing that? Here it is. If all you can think about is what you want, your discernment is just simply not going to kick in. It's not. The moment you stop thinking about what you want, and you begin to remember what the Lord desires of us, or even what somebody else would want, you're going to start seeing things very clearly. That's key. That's why some people are blind to a lot of things in the world, and some people are not. Those who are not, they're actually concerned about the needs of their brother. And you'll never be left empty when you're not thinking about your own needs. You ever try to think about somebody else to visualize what they're doing, you know, what they're talking about or anything else, but then your own personal thoughts jump up in the way? You ever think about that? You ever go to bed at night, you're trying to clear your mind, and all your stuff comes to your mind. What irritates you? What aggravates you? What bothers you? Your shortcomings. Everything about you. And most people on a day-to-day -day basis are flooded by thoughts of themselves. What's bothering them? What's not bothering them? What they can do? What they can't do? And all these different things. If you can focus your mind on the good of somebody else. If you can focus your mind what the Lord would desire out of the world. Oh my goodness, your, your whole everything would open up. You would see the world differently. And nobody could really keep a secret from you. Nobody. They couldn't do it. You know how some people get tricked in? How many people have been tricked by Lucifer in the last 60 days? Some sort of deceitful thing you didn't see coming happened to you. Or something you missed took place. Or something somewhat surprised you. You, none of you should ever be surprised. Not one. None of you should ever, not because you're not worried about anything, but because you can see whatever's coming. Some of you who have been around for a long time, right? You know the weirdest things come out of my mouth. And I won't say it again. I'm not talking about dreams or visions, but weird things. And then about the next week, there they are. Now, most people equate that, well, he's, you know, he's uh, had contacts on the inside or working on the inside, and that's how. The truth is, say, nobody knows how that comes about. But I'll tell you something. One of the key things is I'm often thinking about everybody else. I really take no thought of me. That's a true statement. I don't. It's not some heroic thing. That's not what it is. It's not. I've truly placed my life in the hands of Yeshua. And whatever takes place, I'm fine with. It. But I'm focused on doing things for other people. One telltale trait about that. You start changing that. You start thinking about other people by way of compassion. Every child on this earth will love you. For some reason, they do. They're drawn to you. Every single last one of you have, a, have, have that drawing effect. If, if you could lock, if you could just focus your minds... 
upon other folks and what's good for them. If you could be driven by that, all of you have that ability. But how many of you know it's true that Satan can tie you up with your own issues to where you don't, you can't think about anything else but your immediate problem? Then you look back over years of your life, and all your life you've had immediate problems. Hmm? I quit doing that a while back. I did. I said, whatever happens in my life, if the Lord knows about it, right? I need not take a thought about it. He knows. So I'm going to focus my life on other people. I'm going to walk this thing out by faith. If I fall doing it, if I die doing it, so be it. Nothing can take place unless the Lord approves of it. I choose to believe in him. I don't need proof. And if he's fine with it, so am I. And if he permits it, I'm going to work with it. But I will carry out his directives. So I don't have to take any thought of anything that's transpiring. And I've had some bad things transpire. And people ask me, how, how do you not, how do you just continue to go on with that? I said, because of the Lord. How can anything transpire in my life and the Lord not know about it? And if he knows about it, and he's the one that said he would supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory, I need not worry about it. I just need to learn from it. So I don't waste my time with internal issues, problems, medical reports, any, any of those things. There have been times my life literally fell apart. And Jimmy Crack Corn, you'll never hear me throw a pity party. You won't hear it. People get irritated at me for, for not sharing things. I say, why won't you share anything? Because you can't do anything about it. They do. They get upset. And guess who does something about it? The most high, not sometimes, every single time. I don't need to have a miracle every day. I simply ask the Lord for something to give people. I don't want to be empty. I want to be useful. As far as everything else, he's already got it. He's got it. And so I have peace. A great peace, even when things are going wrong. And all of that stems from me handing my life to the Messiah. By the word of God, he said, take no thought of tomorrow, for today holds enough trouble for itself. He said he would never leave us nor forsake us. He said he would supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. He said that. I don't ask for anything. I really don't. I will pray for wisdom concerning everybody else. I need not pray for me. Need not pray for me. And the Lord has not failed. And I wouldn't trade that for anything. And I'll never come to a point where I know more than everybody else. I'll never do that. A child can teach me. So I can't, I won't step into that pious type behavior. So my eyes are opened because I'm not focused on me. And if any of you ever did that, you'd notice you have clarity in everybody else's situation. Some of you, sometimes you talk about things, typing. And the Lord shows me more. On occasion, I've reached out and contacted people. They swore up and down I had a camera. Or I tapped their phones. A few people got terrified. They shouldn't have been. Later on, they cooled off because they found out I don't yap my mouth. You know, I don't go tell it on the mountain. I don't share it with anybody. There are lots of things I will not share with a soul. Because if a person does not want something, if they want something shared, they'll let me know they want it shared. Otherwise, I will not share it. Because I surely would not. Wouldn't it be bad if the Lord shared everything we repented of to everybody else? Hmm? Yes, that'd be bad. 
It'd be terrible. As a consequence of my life, it's not chaos. No torments. The way I'm talking to you right now, I talk every day to everybody else. This is me every single day of my life. Same calmness, same boring speech, same conversation. Same thing over and over again. It is. Same thing. There's no competition in me, which means I'll never compete with somebody else. I'll never try to outpace anybody else. I don't feel left behind, nor do I feel like I'm in front of anybody else. And the reason why is because people are the reason for me. I am here for somebody else. I'm not here for me. Once you agree with Christ, you become a vessel. A, gla a, 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 a can of soda, right, is not holding the soda because it likes the soda. Could you imagine getting a can of soda, you pour it, and it doesn't want to come out? You're sitting there wondering why. And the truth is, the can likes the soda more than you do. So it's not going to let it out. What would you do with that can? I'd discard it. I'd say, that is unnatural. I'm getting rid of that thing, right? Your vessel. You are. You exist for somebody else. The contents, God has worked tirelessly to get poured into you. You are to pour out on others. All of your experiences, all of your troubles, everything somebody else needs. There's wisdom in you a person cannot get from me. It is specifically from you, and it's meant for specific people. And when you reach those people, they're going to have a breakthrough. You reach the wrong person, well, no breakthrough, because we have lots of vessels on the earth, don't we? You're meant for someone. You are. You've been appointed to be filled up with specific contents. It takes many years to get contents into a person, and you're meant to pour out on somebody else. All of what you've gone through, is it going to be the breaking or making point of somebody else? If you hold it back, it's going to be the breaking point because you did not share it. If you let it go, you wouldn't believe the outcome of it. You wouldn't. That means everything you've gone through is highly purposed. It's not just for a reason. It is highly purposed. It is for the salvation of somebody's soul. It will assist in somebody else's salvation. It will. That's what you're meant for. So this year, be careful not to be consumed and fill up with contents your father did not give you. Be careful of what you become a vessel of. If you believe in Christ, agree to only be a vessel for him. This does not happen by force. You can shut your cap off and nothing else will pour into you, if you so desire. But your life and everything that's happened in it, can you imagine how much coordination it took to have you to have a problem? That would get specifically to you. Most people look at the world in a weird way. They say, oh, it's just misfortune. No, it isn't. No. Much of it is a blessing. You just can't see it. I've known people. So this one person had an accident. Scarred their face. This person before their face was scarred was full of vanities. I mean, they were busy, very attractive, so naturally they drew people who like attractive folks, but their life was going straight down the tubes, if you know what I mean, and when they got this scar, it was such that it caused them to, to it caused people to back up a little bit. When they got the scar, they were broken, 
for a few years. Because they said, now what? You know, Nobody thinks I'm this and nobody thinks I'm that. It took two more years, that's four years total, for this person to consider Christ. They couldn't consider Christ the first time because they were too busy seducing everybody. Too busy enjoying all the attention. Well, that was broken because they had become a person nobody would want to know. To know them personally was to know a devil. After a four-year total, they had come to Christ. To this day, they're thankful for that scar, that disfigurement. Because that disfigurement saved them from losing their souls. They could not see it. They couldn't see it at first. They couldn't see it. To them, that was life. That's what life was about. Only now do they see they made a grave mistake. You see how that disfigurement that they thought was a curse was the greatest blessing in that person's life. It's truly one of those stories that is amazing. There are people who play instruments very well. I mean, real well. And for some reason, these issues kept popping up right before they would make it big to hold them back from making it big and the timing was never right. And I know those people were irritated with life and had many problems until they finally gave their life to Christ. And then they learned the Lord did not block them from success. The Lord blocked them from being lost in the world. Once a person makes it in the world, it's very difficult to get that person to see faith things. They don't have to operate by faith. They become their own savior if they make it big in the world. But the Lord has kept many people from being lost in the world. Many of you look at some of these stars and you say, how lost are they? That's what you say. That could have been you. That really could have been you, but the Lord said no. People who sing, people who play, people who have these, they're like savants in certain areas of life. But for some reason, circumstances kept them from making it in the world. Just is almost like bad timing. Every time you wanted to go forward or could go forward, something would manifest to stop you. And you thought life itself was fighting you and was winning. Many people were angry for years. What they did not know is the Lord was not willing to lose them to the world. Had they become successful in the world, they would have been lost to the kingdom. And the Lord said no. And just imagine, God carefully orchestrated things in your life to keep you, not to lose you. And he's doing that for every single person because everybody has an opportunity. Even the tares get an opportunity. They do. That's a high level of coordination for everybody on earth who has ever lived. Isn't it? Isn't that amazing coordination? And that's a persistence and a consistency not one of us could ever come close to. The Lord's been doing this, and now that you're in a time where you will see things degrade, it's going to start making a lot of sense. Unfortunately for those people who push the Lord away, they're not going to have an understanding as to why these things are happening. or not. Then it's going to become real sad when science or some philosophy becomes their answer to everything that's happening, to give them an answer. Because when things go wrong in your life, you want an answer as to why. Most people say, why? Why, why, why? Well, because you belong to Christ. Your answers will come from the Most High. For those who pushed Christ away. 
They're going to get their answers from the false Christs and the false prophets. One false prophet, you can think of something, a false prophet. What would be worse, a false prophet who speaks of the Lord or a false prophet who speaks of something else? Because I read something in the Bible that named a false prophet. And it's very difficult to believe. Most false prophets do not speak about the Lord. Isn't that something? They speak about deliverance by other means. Like if somebody were to say, hey, this will save your life. This is the answer to your life. This is where you need to be. In this respect, many false Christs, many false messiahs, many false ways of deliverance have been introduced into the world. many and they tell people they are the way and they are the truth isn't that what they say the world right now says science is the way and science is the truth and the world kept saying you have to trust the science if I'm not mistaken the polls that they were using as part of scientific discipline and the numbers were all wrong Remember when they said Trump would lose? Oh, Trump doesn't have a chance, the polls said. Or he's just going to make a fool of himself, the polls said. Isn't that what they said? Isn't that what they said? That's science. Running quadratic equations to get the right trend line. Isn't that, isn't that science? The polling, statistics, isn't that science? Of course it is. And it was 100% wrong. You remember when he won, they looked confused. And they said, well, we don't, know. we don't know what happened. We don't understand what happened. Isn't that what they said? We don't understand what happened. And the people who believed in science did not like Trump when he was elected, did they? They said he was an idiot, didn't they? They said he was a fool, didn't they? Two months later, they were groveling at his feet. Weren't they? As though something quickly changed their spirits. Wasn't that the truth? Hmm? Global warming comes up. Global warming comes up. It is something hardly anybody could see. It is dangerous. It's very dangerous. And people are giving their life to it. What you see happening now is a consequence of people worshiping global warming. Because what did global warming do? I'll tell you what it did. It caused people to start to worship what they call Mother Earth Gaia. Even Christians are calling the Earth Gaia after some paganized belief. Then it causes the other half to deny everything. You know, in the Bible, it is written, I will destroy those who destroy the earth. Uh-oh. But see, now in this time, used in the wrong context, people are picking that up, saying, that's right, see, God was in the global warming and saving the earth. How dumb of a thing is that? To save the earth? He's going to utterly do away with the earth. He just, he said heaven and earth is going to pass away, but his word will never pass away. Isn't that what he said? He told us all the green grass is about to be burned up. One third of the trees are going to be burnt. Every island and every mountain is going to be moved out of its place. The water's going to be turned to bitterness and blood. Nasty stuff. Many people are going to die because of the waters. Oh, and by the way, he's bringing all of this about. 
Our Father is. Not global warming. Our Father is. But now you have Christians who are sold on the idea of the science of global warming. So when a storm comes, they say, oh, it must be mankind. They forgot about the passages when the Lord said he would send the tempest. He's the one that's going to send the winds. He'll send the storm. People parade science, not knowing that man has failed at many attempts to make all the little crafty weapons. Some people have sensationalized failed projects. And some stories have gotten way out of hand. So anyway, here we are in a time where the rest of those who are not taken by these subjects are about to be taken by something else. Global warming could not consume you. Right? Couldn't. The false Christ and the false messages of salvation, these twisted religions that people are coming up with and all the cults, they couldn't get a grip on you. Now something else is at hand. And it's getting a grip on everybody who escaped all the other grips. And even if that fails, there is a contingency. They know that people are involved in politics. They know it. If anything causes you to hate your brother, I'm telling you right now, it is unholy. It is not from your father. It is contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you get sucked in by it and act on it, you will have sealed yourself. And you will be a partaker of the plagues that will be unleashed on all lands. Hatred is going to be dealt with. And the misery is going to be compounded. Please don't be a part of that. Let nothing be able to move you except the word of God. No political conversation should be able to emotionally stir you. Unless you believe in it, listen, you'll only be stirred by those things you actually believe in. You know that, don't you? You can only be moved by something you believe in, and that's good or bad. It does not matter. If you believe in it, you're going to be moved by it. The first step in all these spiritual weapons is to have you believe in something. Once you believe in it, they will move you emotionally. Once you're moved emotionally, they will direct. They will direct you against your fellow man. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. In the Bible, it says Satan will manifest as an angel of light. Does it not? So Satan doesn't come as somebody who's just, you know, doesn't have any answers to anything, no. Satan always comes in the form of a promise. Always. But here's the trick. He always comes in the form of a promise that will always compare the deeds of Satan manifest in the earth by way of a promise. He cannot help but to run his mouth and overstep the bounds of flesh. He can't help that. And don't be fooled by it. Don't, be, don't get sucked into it. Please don't do that. Because people will have consequences. It'll be as though mercy. Mercy.
controversy has been lifted from areas and places and people. I must have hit a nerve somewhere. <laughs> anyway, there we are with that. So, I'm going to take a break while the uh, the ISPs determine what they're going to do. Somebody says the U.S. will experience destruction in the worst way. Watch where things manifest. Keep your families covered with prayer and with examples of love itself. Love is not letting anybody get away with anything. That's not what love is. Your father loves you. He does. But all too often you feel like he does not. Isn't that correct? Somebody one time said, well, you know, the Father loves me, but these people don't. I said, really? So when you prayed, you got the answer to your problem. He fixed your problem right away, didn't he? No, he did not. So when you were sitting there by yourself suffering with something, he fixed it right away, didn't he? No, he did not. Another person said to me, well, you know, people love you. They'll show it. Really? Why are you grumpy today? If the Father loves you, always. How could your mood change? Anybody out there say that? Well, if somebody loves you, they got to show you. Then no Christian on the earth should ever be grumpy. Because your Father loves you. So there shouldn't be a day in your life that you've been grumpy. But we know that's not true. So then love is not giving a person what they want when they want it. Love is not giving a person love in the way that they understand it. Because most love that God gives us, we don't even comprehend. No, no. Love is consistent and real. Love is most often beyond the comprehension of the one that's being loved. Love will always and can only be known at the end. At the end, love will always embrace. In between, you may not notice it. So that means don't, don't live your life by the definition of love that humanity gives you because they don't know what love is. If you want to know what love is, true love is, get to know your father. Get to know how he corrects a person. Get to know how he loves his own people and had them exiled for a number of years. Get to know your father because his love is real. His love will save your soul. His love will move heaven and earth for you. And that's exactly what he did. And he's about to do it again. He's going to move heaven and earth just for you. If not for you, none of these things would ever happen. But he loves you. He loves you and he called you. And he's going to afford you every opportunity to be real family. And if you say yes and you have a desire to be family but you can't quite get things straight, he's going to help you get all things straight. And Christ, he will finish. He'll finish the work he began in you, that work of faith. When you've lost your strength, Christ will become your strength. When you've lost your way, Christ will be your way. He will. It'll all be done soon. Not like the soon that they had a hundred years ago either. Oh, no, no. It'll all be done soon. The process has already begun. I'm going to take a break, and I'll see you guys in just a few minutes right here at COT, if you don't mind. I'll be right back. And then you guys can ask some questions. Don't ever hire me to be a DJ for anything. Never do it. 
In fact, I can build things and make things and can't use my own creations. Isn't that terrible? Can't do it. Anyway, the arts in the ocean. Well, I have to speak hypothetical here. Suppose a long time ago, before the flood, some people had knowledge of the flood, right? And we're talking thousands of years ago. During a very well-built society, during the time where angelic beings were known to be seen on the earth and interact with mankind in bad ways and good ways. So imagine people with that type of knowledge, right? Getting a tip that a flood was coming. Imagine that. So these people, knowing there was a flood, and this could answer some mysteries that you have. Imagine if they built underground dwellings in the ocean. Imagine if these dwellings were super advanced. They used the same techniques they did a long time ago. A long time ago, obviously, they mined metals we don't have today that were in the earth. Right? They had elements we've never heard of. Rocks with properties that would blow your mind. They knew how to use them. Suppose they went in the deepest parts of the ocean. And they lived there. In these societies underneath the oceans. They perpetuated their own races for a long time, staying separate from humanity. Imagine that. Staying hidden separated and hidden from humanity. In the Bible it says there were Nephilim before the flood and also after that. Nephilim before and also after that. If they were so smart, if they had, if they were men of renown and had minds that were so divine, why would they die in the flood? Think about it. If they were incredibly intelligent, you mean to tell me they would drown in a flood? Somebody said, Mike, you mean Atlantis? No, I do not. I don't mean Atlantis. I make zero reference to Atlantis at all. Atlantis is a story. Right? Then it was found that Atlantis was just a word. There are lots of historical tricks out there to cover tracks. Anything that's real from any society that does not want to be found, you better believe. You're not going to find them by these historical things, right? They'll do everything to cover their tracks. As of late, however, in late, I mean probably in the 1960s, man ventured out big time in the deeper parts of the waters. Even NASA had a program. Remember that? Remember NASA's program where they went to the oceans and then all of a sudden they abruptly stopped their program. Remember the people who were not listed as dead but missing underneath the ocean? How, how's, how do you go missing in the ocean? Wouldn't you be categorized as dead? Do you guys know about the waters within the waters? In other words, you swim down far enough. You go into waters that will crush your finger if you stuck your finger below that layer. It looks like a lake. We're not talking about what people have seen on the History Channel or any of these documentaries. No, this is crystal clear water. And nothing can submerge below it. They tried to take a sub below it. They couldn't get the sub an inch in that water. That's how dense this stuff is. Nevertheless, it's water. These waters carry anomalies. So anything in that water has gotten in there a very special way. And nobody can go in that water. No probes, no anything can go in that water. It is crystal clear. It is very dark. It is water, but it's very heavy. They still don't know why. They don't know why. If you were to take a steel ball, solid steel ball, and drop it there, it would just float on top of it. It would not sink. Think about it. Do you know how dense that has to be? 
It is said that the pressure in that water is amplified a thousand times per meter. So every meter you go down, the pressure increases a thousand times what it was. Nobody can penetrate anything below there. But they have seen things under there. They know things move under there. They have, it, it, this covers a vast amount of different territories all throughout the oceans. And they can't do anything about it. They know that some of those heavy water things go inland. They're underneath the U.S., underneath Germany, underneath different parts and places. And things do traverse those waters, although man cannot penetrate them. NASA is the one that discovered them. But NASA, something happened, and they quit that program fast. They, In fact, they even said it. They would rather go into space than to go back down there again. Okay? In 2021, 2016, 2021, something surfaced, or kind of surfaced. They could see it, and it's almost like nobody cared. Right. It was large, and it's there right now, and it's still coming up. So something is coming up from those waters. Something is. It was explained to me one time that mankind lives, not only has a, has a generational life cycle, right? But man also has a cycle, what were they called? A cycle of some kind of rebirth or something like that they were saying. What, what was meant by that is when man starts to rediscover technology, right, man changes to a certain type of individual, right? They're no longer like they were. They even change physically. Once man gets to a certain height of their technology where they're flying again, where they're talking, you know, in devices again, or where they become heavily dependent or integrated, you could say, with technology because we are integrated with technology. That's, that also marks the time of many things that will come back to the earth again. Many things. And it just so happens we're back in that, that, that area again. Right? Like in uh, uh, South America, way down near the poles. If anybody wants to visit those places, go hiking with the ice, they better do it now because all that ice is disappearing. All those icebergs are going to vanish. They're going to be gone. In fact, that's written. It's written in records. All these different things, right? There are seven arcs, by the way, down there. Seven. Seven arcs. It is said there are seven, and they're starting to rise. And when they do rise, they will interact with us again. Probably not in a good way. Probably not. There's a spookier side to that, but I won't share it here on air. I will say this, though. As man increases with every generation, our bodies have produced different hormones. Now we're producing a specific hormone at more, more, more levels than at any other time in history because we visually are stimulated, right? And technology stimulates us in a very specific way that we produce a certain hormone. Well, this causes a mental change in everybody and everything else. So as we go through a specific period, our minds are going to get warped. Just telling you that now. A lot of that has to do with the magnetosphere. A lot of it has to do with that. There are going to be properties in the atmosphere of the earth and underneath the earth that are going to change. We're going to have to deal with. Right now, they're, they're, they're struggling over letting out some information about the UFOs. Here, here's the problem. Though. Most people who are truthful have observed that UFOs come from and go back to the water. Not coming from space, right? Because you would think the ISS would be just inundated with things going all over the place. But the truth is, things come from the water, go up there and they are, and go right back to the water again. We can do that stuff too. But this has been happening for a long time. Long, long time. Some are 
clearly built, and some are not. Some are not. We also have a return of, of, of the fascination of paranormal activity again, right? We do. All that goes hand in hand. All of it, right? There is a manuscript that states this. I cannot tell you what it is because you'll go find it, start reading the whole thing, and I'm not advising anybody just jump to that just yet, but it says this. When the sun no longer shines on the earth, the breath of destruction will consume everything. The only thing holding back the breath of destruction is the sun. And we will have a time where the sun will not shine upon the earth. And in that time, in that time, everybody, it says, will pray. Not just one or two. Everybody will pray. In my estimation, it is true the Lord has set up mechanisms to keep us in a way that we probably do not fully understand. But the Lord is certainly active in keeping us. Because if he were not, we would not make it. And here's the truth. If we go to a place where the sun's light does not reach, we're doomed. And these places where the sun's light does not reach just so happens to be deep down in the waters or deep in the earth. And there are never good stories that come from deep down in the water or deep in the earth. Never. Never, never. So, but we're going to find all that out. In the Bible, when the bottomless pit is opened, what do you think will come out of that bottomless pit? A bunch of people? Or a bunch of critters? And they're not dumb because they have instructions. And what do you make of all these things people are seeing that don't even know each other? They had a test, a, a, a very deep test of something one time. They induced people into a, a very deep sleep and then into a state of hypnosis, right? Where they were like halfway waking. And they made up a scenario. And they asked the person, right? What do you see? Yes, out stars. What do you see? These people did not know each other. This happened over the course of years. This happened before the UFO story was even popular. They asked people, what do you see? And people said, I see a light. They're coming to get me. There were different ages and everything else, and people said the exact same thing. They said, what's happening? They said, I'm they're, exam they're looking for things, they're examining me, and this, all this kind of stuff, right? In other words, what I'm telling you under hypnosis, people tend to tell the same story, that they have an encounter with something. Something, I believe, is demonic. Not, not quite what people think. In modern times, they had, Harvard did that same thing. Same answers. They're coming to get me. What are they doing now? They're, they're having medical ex experiments upon me. They took me. They're, they're doing medical things. The exact same story. So let me ask you, why do people in a, in a state like that of hypnosis have the exact same scenario? Why do they always tell the exact same scenario? Why? You know what I believe it is? You know what I believe it is? The same reason why people have dreams of older times. I believe it, it's in our genetics. I do. I believe it's in our genes, right? Your genes carry stories. And I believe that in times of old, we're talking a long time ago, something happened so bad to people had encounters so bad, it echoes all the way up into this very day. That's what I believe. And I believe that those things are doing what they did back then. They're doing it again. 
And I'm specifically speaking of the fallen angels, who I believe are highly active in civilization right now. That's what I believe. Somebody said, did Abel Bird, did he really land and see a mammoth? I believe he did. Due to the stories in Australia, due to stories of 2020, due to observations of, 2000, of uh, 1995 and 1997, I believe he did. Because if, if there are known sightings and observations and tests, in the 90s, surely he saw something back then, too. And then there are recent stories that happened in a specific country where a group of, uh, lots of leaders went to go visit this place, too, and found it to be true. They went into a place, into one country, they went into a place, went underneath the ground, right? And they saw what they couldn't believe, like a prehistoric world. They can't get down there but they can certainly see into it. Think of it as seeing through a hole, right, down through mountains, and you see a bunch of life down there, but you can't get there. Grass, estimated to be, you know, 8 feet tall. Trees, estimated to be 60 to 100 feet tall, right? Insects that are, you can hear them. Even though you're about 40,000 feet up, you can still hear them, right? Animals. That, that just shake everything when they do what they do. Everything is feathered, right? So unlike the stories that we're familiar with, dinosaurs walking around with just hairless, no, not that way. Not that way. They had both hair and feathers at the exact same time. Very colorful, right? Just like birds use their feathers to show warnings and everything else, so do those things. And we're talking about a story that was, you know, this is not too old of a story, right? We're, we're talking about something as recent as a year ago. We're also talking about something that, that it, there's a serious consideration of introducing this thing to the world so that the world can see with our own eyes, you know, go and see with our own eyes. So evidently somebody found a cavity of some sort, a huge cavity of some sort, where life was not disturbed. Can that actually happen? Sure it could, based on how the earth is structured. You better believe it. You better believe it. It absolutely happened. So Admiral Byrd, yeah, yeah, the, that's a, believe it or not, those who, if somebody ever knew the truth about that expedition, right, even if they told everybody the truth, it'd be a waste of words. Here's what happens. It sounds fascinating, right? But suppose it was true. If it were true, it's still not going to be enough for anybody to actually absolutely believe that story. See, when somebody, even eyewitnesses of things, tell people something that is absolutely true, it does no good. Because if people say, oh, great, I just need a little more proof. Right? You'll never be satisfied until you see it yourselves. You'll never be satisfied. You can't be satisfied. Because knowing about something fantastic is one thing. Right? Believing it, what that word should be is people would say, I need to see it. That means nobody could ever bring forward enough proof to prove to anybody any of these things are real. A person would have to experience that. But I'll tell you, when they experience it, the world is turned upside down. It may seem like, you know, well, that wouldn't turn anybody's world upside down. Yes, it would. Because it brings up too many possibilities. And just your life would be shaken, somewhat miserable. It would. Anyway, that's why a lot of people, they have lost their lives for nothing. They have tried to bring the truth forward. Right? And it's just not enough to be absolutely believable. It's just not enough. Not stories like that. Right? Even if you have internal confirmation that mankind has discovered something, there are some things discovered. You still need some, some, some thing, some tangible proof. To, if you saw a specimen from that time, I'm telling you right now, it still wouldn't be enough. It would not be enough. It wouldn't be enough. And 
unfortunately, that that's you know where we are today. Somebody says answer seem to bring more questions. Yes, because ultimately a person would have to go and see it, right? They'd have to go and see it. Just like the albino, um, the, the um, albino elephants and the albino uh, rhinos, right? When they were first talked about, people said, okay, but they still couldn't believe it. The albino alligators that would glow underneath the water, you know, like a bluish, they would have the, the, the blue eyes, beautiful blue eyes. People said, oh, yeah, that could happen, but, yeah, that's hard to believe. And they didn't believe it until they went to go see it. Then when they saw it, it was something in their minds that did not want them to accept it, right? Because when they saw it, they said, well, somebody must have tampered with these animals. One, one scientist thought it was paint from a distance. He said, well, somebody, surely somebody painted those, you know, animals, right? So until people, until they are living amongst it, they're not going to accept it. And, and I'll tell you something. It's going to be too late once they've been introduced to it, you know. Once they've been inter introduced. Somebody says, uh, where in day 13, did it was, so what are you talking about? Could be a movie, The Abyss? No, I saw The Abyss. I saw The Abyss. And although The Abyss, it is a story, right? Things like that happen to this day. Mining underneath in the ocean. Right. Uh, for example, the, these um, uh, these these uh, oil rigs right out to sea, they have to really venture. They have to go down deep. And sometimes they have, you know, uh, deep suit uh, or liquid suit uh, divers who go down there and do what they have to do. These underwater geologists, they have to really uh, sample everything. They really do. So they run into things, too. So when I said, what is Jupiter and what is it about to do? Well, you know what? Jupiter is the same thing as Marduk, right? Marduk, that, that entity named Marduk is Jupiter. And there's a prophecy about Marduk outside of Zechariah Ascension, though these works are public. It says that Marduk is the one that will open the gates. And the young men of Dil Moon will flood the earth. And flood the earth. But Marduk will open the gates. In fact, it said when, when, the, when the old ways are rediscovered again, Marduk is going to open the gates and the young men of Del Moon will pour forth. It said before that that men would fight over the black nectar in the desert. That's what it said, that men would fight over the black nectar in the desert. So there are prophecies out there. Somebody says, uh, what did somebody say they were inky and in little? I, well, you know, according to what's public, they read, right? I, I have an issue with things that are public, um, with the translations of Zachariah Ascension. Because as I told you guys, the military has translated the Sumerian text. And what they came up with was some things in Zachariah Ascension's writings were real, but some things are worse than what he ever proposed. Right? Nibiru, for example, the word was a bit altered, but it meant the womb. That's what it meant. The womb was coming back to here to earth. And that these things came from the womb. But unlike Zechariah Ascension, they did not need gold to go back. They couldn't go back. They were exiled. The one who controls the fates exiled them to earth, and they could not come back. They didn't create man, they tampered with mankind and all animals to suit their needs on this earth. And then the one who controls the fates warned a human being to build an ark. This is in the original Sumerian text as translated by the governments over, over a long duration of time. They essentially told the same story of the book of Enoch and what's in Genesis. They told the exact same story. And then Inky and Enlil were frightened. They were scared to death because the one who controls the fates had talked to humanity. And at that point, they knew they were out of the picture. They could not go home. They were out of the picture. And then four noble sons were sent 
to expel the Nephilim and to bind up all those who tampered with humanity. That's essentially the story of Enoch. And the story in Genesis is the exact same story. But more information was there, like blueprints for the new ark, because it did tell a story that a new ark would have to be made. It did. It told a story of the exact conditions we're going through today. It foretold those two. It did not pay homage to any Sumerian gods. It, it was simply plaques, and it showed their vanity. I, I believe it's in the scroll of, uh, what is it? The scroll of something. Anyway, what I believe happened, people want their narrative to be true, right? And so when you have people who are prideful, who start translating something, and they have a thought, or they're thinking something, they're going to make it true. They're going to put anything in there they have to put in there. You have a lot of people now who are trying to convince people that the tablets of thought are good for everybody to read. Are you kidding me? That the tablets of thought speak in more circles than I do. And if anybody speaks in more circles than I do, nobody should ever look at it. That's what that is. Mem 4 fixes says, I'm done asking questions. Hey, just repost them. That's all you have to do. Just repost them. Because you guys are scrolling so quick, it's hard to see them. Repost them. Please repost them. Don't think I'm ignoring you. That's not the case. He's saying, you guys are going away out there. Why is the sun and moon going out of position? The external influence is getting heavier and heavier. Heavier and heavier. Listen, when a binary system comes close to its to, to the other system, right? A photonic exchange takes place. Now, this, this is something they observed. They actually observed this. I believe they observed this over a six-year period with a certain group of, a certain cluster of stars anyway. The, the one star started sucking the photons and some materials out of the brightly lit star. There was a photonic exchange. And some of the smaller, you know, objects in that solar system no longer received light. All light was redirected towards the new sun. So essentially, when one sun comes around another, it recharges. The weaker sun recharges off the, the greater sun. And you have a photonic exchange. Now, as it gets closer, something else. It could be way out there where nobody can see it. As soon as it appeared, it was traveling twice as fast as it used to travel. And then as it gets closer, that speed increases, right? Until it goes right around that star, and then it loses velocity going back out. So that process can take hundreds of thousands of years. But as it comes in, it speeds up. It speeds up. In our case, as something enters in, when people see it, it's going to be too late. By the time people actually get the proof of what they're saying, the forces on Earth will be such that nobody's going to care what's out there. They're going to be surviving while they're here. Right? And as far as the sun going blank, the passage is estimated to take more than 15 days. And so that means more than 15 days of no sunlight whatsoever. But we will have infrared, right? Because all photons still have spectral emissions of light, which means the Earth is going to get so hot, so hot. Anything in that higher wave, that, that wavelength where you see light, if it hits the clouds or something like that, it can be reflected. Once it's reflected, it can knock all the photons out, which actually keeps us cool, right? Without visible light, it's going to do nothing but heat up on the surface of the Earth. Can you imagine everything on Earth red? I mean red, but hot, right? Hot, like, like an infrared heater. The same effect. Same effect. So sometimes when you're looking at these biblical things, and you start finding out things like that, it's, it, it's, a, it, it's a little more shocking than when you first believed, right? Because infrared light is dangerous. So I said, Mike, the things that will change, 
thinking because of what's happening in space the world. I believe our Lord will cover those in Christ. If listen to me closely, I mean, somebody says that you know, with the atmosphere changing and the changing in our body's chemistry and how the brain operates and functions, that those who believe in Christ are going to be covered by the blood of the Lamb, right? I want you guys, that's true. But you've got to be covered by the blood of the Lamb. To be covered by the blood of the Lamb means you're walking in the ways of the Most High. So let me give you an example. First the ladies, then the men. Ladies, when you're going through your time, your mood can change based on the chemistry in your body. As a consequence of that, you treat people differently. And you know that, right? You feel irritated. And when you feel irritated, right, you can lash out. Can you control that? Can you never do that again? The answer is yes. You can never do that again. But to never do that again means you're no longer operating by your flesh, but by the spirit. So what does that mean? To walk by flesh and walk by spirit can be known by those who understand what it is to have a bad attitude because of a chemistry change in the body. Now, when you can override that, you do so in a very specific way, then you're good to go. You cannot overdo that without Christ because you'll never have a hope strong enough and true enough to have a root to do it with. So think about the most irritating time you've when you just felt aggravated like you wanted to scream. Think of that, right? Like you wanted to just scream. And what did you do? You told everybody, leave me alone. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to mess with you. Well, guess what? That's giving in to your flesh. The influences on this planet are going to make people become just like that. And worse. And worse. Remember the people, the, 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 some of the Russians, right? The two guys that went out there, that went outside went outside that influence of the earth, they turned into barbaric animals. And it was irreversible. If you ever get aggravated and moody, that's the time when you can find out if you can walk by the Spirit or not. See, to walk by the Spirit is not, is not you walking in holiness because you, you, know, you read something. Nope. It means you're not governed by the flesh. It means you're not going to do anything based upon your mood. You're not going to do anything based upon any pain that you feel, any injuries, any bad conditions in your life. That's what it means. That means you're no longer going to interact with people and have that be influenced by how you feel. So imagine you feel totally rotten. And you feel irritated and everything else. To walk by the Spirit is to be guided by spiritual things. For example, the Lord said, love your enemy as yourself. Do good to all men. Right? So then you walk like that and you say, it's, it's a simple adjustment. Hey, internally I feel so aggravated. But then you talk to the person outside of your aggravation. How do you, how do you overcome that? Become concerned about the other person over yourselves. When you're irritated like that, all you can seem to do is respond to how you're feeling. Ladies, you can override that and set your chemistry back even without estrogen. If you ever look into the person, deny yourselves by looking into the person and focus on their needs. That's all you have to do. As soon as you focus on somebody else's needs, your chemistry is going to change. I'm just telling you what I know, guys. The same thing happens. When everything is falling apart and you're at that emotional area where you're pressing everything in. Right? At that point, you could sometimes, you, you could so easily punch something when you're holding everything in. Right? But in that moment, you're just thinking about what you're holding in. What happened to you is like a rehearsed story over and over again in a male's mind. All you have to do is stop listening to that story. Go find someone. Look into someone and say, I wonder what they need. Forget about me. I wonder what they need. You focus on that, you're going to be reset. And if you don't believe me, try it. 
The next time you have a bad mood, you're in a bad mood, and you have that story rehearsing all about you, what happened to you, who's doing something to you, start focusing on somebody else and say, what do they need? What do they need? And you're going to be amazed. In that very moment, you're going to be amazed. Oh, that's all you have to do is focus on somebody else and focus on what they really need. And everything will change at that point. That aggravating feeling that you felt, it cannot stay. And guess what? Once you do that once, you can do that always. You can live out your life like that. Okay. Somebody said, Mike, is the second Enoch false? Well, you have to explain that to me. The second Enoch. What is the second Enoch? Is somebody writing more books out there? Listen, the book of Enoch is a good reference book. It gives nothing authoritative. Nothing. It's a simple document, a historical document of what happened, right? And if you look into the book of Noah, into the book of Enoch, which is all wrapped up in that one thing, right? The prophecy it gives is perfectly aligned with the Old Testament. I mean, precisely. It only speaks of one thing. You ready? It repeatedly speaks about Christ. It repeatedly speaks about the one that was reserved. That Satan thought he was so slick to destroy mankind, but how good God is. How that he kept the one that would come at a specific time. Most people pick out the giants in the book of Enoch, but the greatest story in the book of Enoch is God's persistent and his faithfulness in sending Jesus. The book of Enoch speaks about Jesus all the time. They call Jesus the hidden one, the one that's reserved, the one that will cover the, the, the sacrifice for earth, that will cover the sins for all mankind. God's plan, God's plan on covering his family. Right? Enoch was excited about it. Okay, he had to deal with the giants and all that stuff. That was a big deal back then. Right? But even God was faithful to save humanity through their destruction of corruption and to bind them that they would never interfere with humanity again. But then it started talking about the promise of those who would stay faithful and how they would fall short and how God would send the helper who is Christ. Hmm? And Enoch, if you read that whole thing, Enoch, now, I don't suggest reading all versions. There's one version I read. One version. That's it. And it edifies Christ throughout the whole thing. I think I read it too much. Because honestly, you start, you know, when you read something too much, you start reciting it. I, I think I read Enoch, my goodness, at least about eight times. At least eight times. But it does. It edifies Christ. So when you're talking about is it authoritative? It doesn't touch anything dealing with authority. It doesn't. Not at all. Somebody says, Revelation 22.1.5, For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and adulterers, whoever makes a lie. And I thought the millennial reign was full of peace and Lord wellness. Look at this, 22.15. It is. 22.15. Let's, let's read it. Let's read 22.15 because you're in the summary section. Here it is. Here it is. 22.15, you ready? Ready? All right, let's start 22.6. And he said unto me, These things are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophet sent his angels and showed unto his servants, servants the things which must shortly be done. And behold, I come quickly, blessed is he that keepeth the saying of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard what I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren, the prophets, of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. And he saith unto me, seal not those sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Don't you seal them up, because the time is happening now. This was back then. Thank you for pointing me to this. Let me continue. And, and that is, and he that is unjust, let he be unjust still, and he that is filthy, let him be filthy still, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, 
and my reward is with me to give to every man according to his work or according as this work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. For without or outside of that city are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and adulterers and whoever, whosoever loveth and maketh a lie, right? I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come and let him that hears say, come and let them that, let them that are a thirst come. And whosoever will, let them take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of this prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this uh, book. He which testify these things, saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, he said, your question was, you thought there would be peace in the millennial reign? This is a summary of the purpose of Revelation. That's what this is. This is at the very, this is at the end. This is the purpose of it, right? He closes the entire thing up after judgment, saying these things are true. These things are true. That's what he's saying. Now, but the part I want to point your attention to is this. And he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. See? That's a summary. You, you guys see that? It's a summary. It's a summary of all things. That depicts no no specific portion of it. And the dogs, listen, the holy city, where's the holy city at? The holy city is in the heavens. Outside of the holy city is what? The earth. The earth is full of dogs and everything else, and the time is at hand. So he described the time then. It has nothing to do with the millennial reign has to do with right now. If he says the time is at hand, and it, right before he said that, he said, or, or what was it? Yeah, right before he said that, he was talking about what was in the earth, which is outside the city. When you read the term outside the city, ha have an understanding that he's talking about the holy city, which is in the heavens, which will come out of the heavens, the new Jerusalem. It is untouched. So when he's talking about outside of that city, he's talking about the earth. Right, And so the earth right now in this state is filled full of filthy dogs and sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, adulterers, and whosoever loveth to make, make a lie. And that's what it's full of. Right? But I want to bring it back to this point. He also said the time is at hand. Not the time is coming, but the time is at hand. Which is why I always emphasize the opening of the seals, not something to come, but something that has been underway, and we are born in the middle of it and can't see it. So many people have come and have convinced so many this time is in the future. They're missing the iniquity right now in their faces. This world is filthy. There's no good in it. The only potential of good in this world is Christ within you. There's no good in this world. None. The seals, peace has been taken from the earth. There's been no peace in the earth. None. That first rider of the first seal, he's been riding. The one with a bow, with no arrow, given a crown, he went forward to conquer, right? Nations have been concerned about taking over each other ever since that time, even before. 
Men have been dying steadily. That number is increasing by animals, right, by war, by all sorts of things. These things have been happening in the earth. And what about the other angel? Death and hell follow close behind it, right? We know what the Lord said. We know what the Lord said to that thief versus what was happening with some other folks in there. Hell enlarged itself. Why? Because the people who were never meant to go to hell have chosen to go there because of what they follow. They will go to the place of the one they follow. Jesus told us that. But what about that thief on the cross that recognized Jesus Christ, that had zero good works? Jesus said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. That's what he said. He said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. The apostle later on answered the question of those who were still asleep in the earth, who were not like that thief. See, that thief accepted Christ on the cross, and when that happens, you're not going into oblivion. To wait and then come. No, you're not doing that. You're going to be with the Lord. What about those who died before Christ? Those who were condemned. What did the Lord do? He went right down to Sheol. Took the keys of hell and death. He took the keys. So now nobody dies and nobody goes to hell unless Christ says you go to hell. And nobody dies unless Jesus says you're going to die. Nobody's dying early. Nobody's dying late. God has given all power unto the Son. The Son is wearing the crown, Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. Those who are faithful who die, Jesus will honor his word. They will go with him. And those who are asleep, who did not live in the time of Christ, who did not go to hell, they too will rise. Those who are asleep in the earth, you know, the, some, of the, some of the ones, that stagnant ones, well, they're going to be dealt with too. Even hell is going to be brought straight up to be thrown into this eternal place. And you're going to judge the angels. I personally do not believe you're going to judge Michael, Uriel, Raphael, Gabriel. You're not going to get. You're not going to judge them. You're going to judge the fallen angels. Even in the original text, the word "angel" in that context referred to those who had fallen, of whom they they were an angel. You you could say in the Greek was an angel with a special connotation, which meant defamed angel, a defamed messenger. You're going to judge them. Why are you going to judge the angels? Because you're living in the conditions that they started. Now, all this mess you see, who started the money system? They did. Who started the kingships in the earth? They did. God just made sure that these kings who rule over these lands, their hearts would change when dealing with you. That their hearts... God will take over when it comes to you. But they're the ones that taught mankind all this junk in the earth. They taught mankind about money, how to use money as a balance for everything. They taught mankind about politics, even the setting up of the organization of politics itself. So all these things come down from ancient, ancient, ancient times, which came from the fallen angels. Documenting things. It tells a story about the fallen angels gave that knowledge to man early, and God wanted man to reflect upon things, to actually live with the knowledge they had, that they may walk by it. When they started writing, they quit walking by the knowledge they had, and they simply stored that knowledge. God said he was going to give this to mankind in time. Well, they were responsible and mature enough that it would be good, all of it, but the fallen angels, just like Lucifer, gave it too early. And when you give knowledge too early, people do not have the maturity to use it. 
and they abruptly pervert it. The knowledge we have now, 80% of it is poured into weapons. 80%. Some of the knowledge you're not able to access. But it's used to have power over you. Why won't they share all the knowledge with everybody? Because they have a heart in them where they want to control everybody else. Hmm? I don't know how I get on that subject. Let me get back to the other. What was the other? Somebody says I had multiple dreams about destruction everywhere. If I am somewhere, can I visually see destruction before? Snap 2, can you explain? If you, you had dreams about destruction everywhere, and if I am somewhere, can I visually see destruction before? I snap 2. Oh, well, I'd say yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just listen. Hear me on this, please. Someone says, can you explain the Archangel Uriel? Well, that would take a context, but listen to me about seeing things. Please listen to me. If you're one of those who sees things, you must subject everything you see to the Lord. Never assume something is from the Most High or something is useful for everybody else. Now, please never assume that. Everything you see, you try it. And you rebuke any influence that is not sent from Yahshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. I, it doesn't matter if you saw the winning numbers to the lottery ticket. You put it in subjection right then and there. And rebuke anything that is not from the Most High. Then you seal that and ask for the Lord's approval to go forward with that thing. But never assume anything is from the Most High. Please never do that. Somebody says, can you explain communion? Yes, communion was something the Lord commanded us to do to partake of Him. But you may not want my full explanation because anybody who is not devoted to Christ, listen to me, I'm not talking about religion. That's Christ. Here's what I mean. When you take communion, you are partaking of that walk of Christ. And you're going to be tried by what you partake of. Meaning, Jesus died for us, didn't he? Jesus suffered the world's abuse for us. And the world hated him. Though he still walked, he still forgave, he did not fight, he didn't, he spread the gospel. The good news, didn't he? He fought the good fight of faith. If a person partakes of communion, but they will not obey the commandments of Christ, they're dooming themselves. If you cannot love your enemy, you, you can't take communion because you're not going to partake of Christ. And you're going to curse yourself. To partake of Christ is to partake of his death. And he died. He died, by the way, having operated opposite of what the world operates by. Didn't he? He died for people who would not die for him. You're going to partake of that? Because when you take communion, you're doing that in remembrance of him. Partaking of his body that suffered abuses. For the sake of his holiness, of his way. So I'll say it again. If you cannot love your enemy, you can't partake of him. Because if you can't love your enemy, that means you're not willing to forgive him that you would love him. And if you cannot forgive, you cannot partake. And if you do so, you do so in a mockery of what Jesus stood for, which will curse a person. The warning is in there about those who are not fully aligned with Christ. It's in there. Hmm? Somebody said, question, what if we take communion and sin again? 
Well, no, it has. It, it doesn't have anything to do with falling. It has everything to do with what you honestly agree with. Ask yourself this. Do you honestly agree that everybody should be forgiven? Because the Father did. Do you agree with it? Or do you have an enemy? Do you have somebody in the world you think needs to pay for their crimes? Because the Father said he would forgive all crimes. But do you have somebody you believe should pay for their crimes? Come on, you've got to fess up. You've got to speak up. Because the only way you can say everybody should be forgiven of their crimes is if you understand the enemy and how he uses people. Because we're not at war with flesh, with people, but the spirits that use people, that deceive people. That's what we're at war with. And God gave us weapons, not for people, but for the spirits that would dare consume people. We're in a battle against that. Oh, here's a big one. Do you have political enemies? Uh-oh. Have you pointed your finger and said, that person... They, they just need to just go and go to jail because you can't take communion with that thought. Your father does not agree with you. So how could we partake of the word of God and we don't even agree with God? If a person has life, then God does not agree that they should be imprisoned, that they should die. See, we've we got to be real on that level. But once a person is real on that level, they're going to find themselves never powerless again. People are powerless because they don't agree with the gospel. They're getting there, but they don't agree with it. Because they're allowing people and spirits in the earth to give them too many reasons to hate someone. Satan is the one that will give you a reason to hate someone, to dislike someone. God will never do that. So if we do dislike someone because of what we heard, we're doing so by the word of darkness itself. There are people, I do not like the job they're doing. I wouldn't let them do a job cutting potatoes. But I love that person. Do you hear what I'm saying? I don't love what they do. I don't love what they say. I don't, but I love that person. You know what it means? If that person, were to ever need help, I would not hesitate. I have nothing against them. I do not like what they do because what they do is after the spirit that overpowers them. But I love the person. I find the people precious. The spirits that work through people are disgusting. And they're the ones I fight. Not the person. The person overtaken by spirits is losing the battle. If they're overtaken by spirits, they have, they're losing the battle. But while God still gives them breath, there's still time. That goes for a devil worshiper. That goes for anybody out there like that. Why would somebody worship the devil? Because they don't know who he is. That's why. Why would somebody do something so grotesque? Because they don't know the penalty for it. That's why. Because they're believing a lie and not the truth. Because they think it's okay and that means somebody has lied to them. And we're not here to condemn flesh, but to fight those spirits that are condemning people. That's what God empowered you to do. Nobody else is doing that in the earth. That is reserved for you. He called you to do that. But what happened? When you start believing what the world believes, you're going to find yourself powerless. Broken of spiritual things and resorting to science to be the answer to your whole life. That's what will happen. Because if you have not experienced the power, you can't account for it. And if you can't account for it, you're going to believe the scientists. What would happen if a scientist saw somebody walking on water? They saw, oh, there was probably frozen or something under it. They would instantly come up with something. Why? Because they do not know the power of the living God. That's why. 
If you know the power of the living God, you'd never say something like that. You wouldn't even comment. When you don't know the power of the living God, you can only go with what you truly know. And what men truly know are the excuses and the explanations they truly give. Which means a lot of people are powerless. They're not acquainted with the power of the living God. If a person is acquainted with the power of the living God, they would never be upset. They'd never be depressed. Because they would never ever believe at any time that somehow they're not going to be delivered. They would never ever have that concern or belief. If they knew the power of the living God. But if you don't know the power of the living God, you will worry. You will. You'll shake in your boots. Because you don't know if you're going to be delivered or not. But when you know it's real, you know it's real. You're not going to worry about anything. Hmm? You're the ones purposed to know it's real. You're to be witnesses of God's power, his deliverance, his salvation. You are to be witnesses of that. You're to be filled with trust and confidence. You're not to be one of those who has never witnessed the power of the living God in his or her own life. You're to walk in impossible conditions, and the only way you can do that is to have absolute confidence and faith in Christ. You are to be a witness of your Lord. Once you're a witness of your Lord, there are certain things you'll never see again. There are certain ways you'll never have again. You'll never feel sorry for yourself. You'll never condemn yourself. You'll never do that. Why? Because you'll know what your Lord died for. And you'll know that what he does is not in vain. You may not see all the value of yourself, but you'll certainly see the value in humanity. Hmm? You'll be witnesses. But you must ask yourself the question, do I agree with the real gospel of Jesus? who said to love your enemy as yourself, who said to do good to those who despitefully use you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you. Do you really agree with that? We can't sidestep that. A lot of people sidestep that. And this adoption of speech from the world from somebody who believes in Christ to speak like those in the world speak, to have a dragon's tongue? What is that all about? Somebody said, please clarify the number one cause of, nope, never gave the number one cause of death. I never did. We'll cover that a little later. That's a very touchy subject. It's a very touchy subject. But I never said alcoholism is the number one cause of death. I said that's higher than drugs because it leads to a few things. But don't worry, we'll cover it all. That's why I said that we should have a project here to pull out the real numbers. But if we do that, we're going to make ourselves a target. That's a fact. A big fact. Somebody says, regarding forgiveness, why do you think, wouldn't God forgive those fallen angels that were repentant, Adoc, nope, and wanted to return to God, is willing to forgive mankind by sending Jesus, die for sins? Oh, good question. Somebody says, well, if the fallen angels, if they sin, wouldn't God be willing to forgive them too because he's willing to forgive us? No, he would not. Let me tell you why. Anybody want to know why? Why wouldn't God forgive the fallen angels, but he'll forgive us? Does anybody know why? Do you want to know why? Hmm? Anybody? That's a very, that is, that has to be the best question I could ever get. Really. The best one 
I could ever get. Because so many people have that question, they just haven't said it. Right? They haven't said it yet. They haven't said it. So just in case you did not hear that one, the, the, a few broadcasts I gave, I'm going to give it again. With us, right? When we have sinned, all you have to do is think about it. Anytime you have sinned, after you feel the weight, the guilt of your sin, what do you do later on in life? You hold your head down and you say, I, I had no idea. Lord, I had no idea. I am so corrupted. I had no idea, Lord. That was that bad. I know it. And that's the truth. Listen, it's because you really did not know. If we knew what sin truly was, we wouldn't agree with sin. The only reason we sin is because we think we can get away with it. Nobody's going to see it. That means we really don't know. We really don't know the consequences of it, do we? Huh? We don't know. If we knew how our father felt about sin for real, we would never do it. If we knew that one thing, the father's heart concerning sin, if we actually knew that, I mean really knew it, none of us would ever sin. We wouldn't. Because we would not be willing. We would not be willing to break the father's heart. See, but the truth is, there have been many days we knew of the Father, but we did not know him. There are many days we knew of the Lord, but we did not know him. The more you get to know Christ, the more you regret ever sinning in the first place. Isn't that true? We regret that we sin in the first place because it is dishonor to the Messiah. How many of you have reflected back on your life and your sin and you said, Lord, I am so sorry? Because why? You say you're sorry because the more, the, the more you know the Lord, the more you understand his goodness, his good nature. Not because you're afraid, because you're starting to realize that God is love, that he did nothing but love us. He never betrayed us. He put up with everything about us. And so most people run around saying, oh, I just want to be pleasing unto the Lord. And that takes a lot of reflecting to ever do that. Right? So that's what gets us to repent is when we learn of the Lord more and more and more and more. Right? What about the fallen angels? Oh, by the way, the evil people. Do you think anybody would go to the church of Satan if they knew what Satan actually was? If they knew what hell was, they would not go. If somebody, right, if somebody knew what hell was, by the way, let me put this, demons are afraid of hell. They're afraid. Don't think they're down there throwing a party. I don't believe that. Because when Jesus came up to that man that was possessed by those demons, those demons got frightened and they says, oh, no, have you come to, to, to do what you got to do before the time? And they begged of him, no, don't send us back there. They said, in fact, they said, what have we to do with thee, thou son of man? That's a statement of fear. The demons were afraid of the Messiah. They said, we have nothing to do with you. We didn't do anything. We're just doing what we do by nature. What have we to do with thee, thou son of man? That's a fearful statement. They were scared to death. Jesus did not suffer them to say too much. And they asked to go into a bunch of pigs to drown rather than to go to hell itself. Right? What, what is Jesus to do? He is the one that will condemn them. He is their warden. And so when Jesus says, you're gone, they're gone, that is the final judgment upon them. That is given to the Messiah. And demons were terrified. So listen to me. If demons are terrified to go to hell, what do you think a human being would feel like? If a demon that can scare the peanuts out of, a, out of the M&Ms of a human being is afraid to go to hell itself, don't you think we would be terrified to go to hell? If a demon is afraid, we're going to be mortified, right? So if people truly knew what they were worshiping and what the penalty was, there'd be nobody in the church of Satan. Nobody would be there. So what does that tell you? They don't know. 
What does Satan do, though? He deceives. They are deceived. They're deceived. If they knew what awaited them, they'd run out of that place, renounce everything. They'd run to Jesus so quick it wouldn't even be funny. But God doesn't want us to cling to Jesus because we're afraid to go to hell. So he did something else. Nothing is visible to us. And so if we cling to Jesus, it's going to be by truth, not because we're afraid. If we saw the Father, if we saw the manifestation of the heavens, if we saw the fullness of everything, we would be terrified to ever do anything wrong. And we would not do anything wrong. God doesn't want children who are terrified to sin. And then they cling to him, just like you wouldn't want somebody to cling to you because they're afraid of what would happen if they're not clinging to you. I don't want a friend like that. That's not a friend. A friend is a friend when they're not afraid, and they can choose anybody, but they happen to have chosen you, and they have a real bond with you. That's a real friendship that will last forever, and nothing can break it. If they're your friend for any outside reason, that friendship is going to fall apart. Do you know why? If a person is your friend, because of what they need from you, they're going to find somebody else in time that they need something more from. And they'll no longer be your friend. They're going to be the other person's friend. When you have a genuine friendship, that person does not need you. A real friend does not need you. I know the movies teach you differently. But a real friend doesn't need you. A real friend will simply love you. A real friend is not your friend because of something. They cannot explain how you really met. They can explain that. Right? That friendship then grows by relationship that was not based on anything on earth or anything anywhere else. And when you have a true friendship, nothing can break it. The only thing that can actually break a friendship is when you break what one person needed out of it. Right? Listen to me. Our relationship with the Father is based on what? What is it based on? My relationship with Christ is based on what he did for me. It's not based on anything else. It's based on what he did for me. It is. If he would do that for me, and he did that for everybody else, my goodness, he doesn't need to do anything for me ever again. He never, he never has to do anything else for me again. He already did it all. Now, I want to honor him with everything I am. And I do my best. I do. So, that, that's when somebody really is in a friendship. So, back to that initial question. How come the fallen can't be forgiven? Well, if our relationship with Christ is being, is being put together by, by a, a real bond, not by fear, right? Not by consequence and all this, but it's going to be based in, in realness. And we have to operate by faith to do that. Because we really don't know, but the fallen angels really do know. That's the difference. We really don't know. They really do know. They already knew. They knew of his majesty. They knew what hell was. They knew what all those things were. And when they chose, they chose for real. When we choose, we do so out of the dumbest reasons, don't we? Because had we known the truth, we wouldn't choose half the things we choose. But they knew the truth, and they chose anyway. So there is no forgiveness for them. Why do you think God has us walking by faith? We have not seen, or nothing's been proven to us. We're doing everything by faith. Because if we were shown, if we were actually shown, and we actually were partakers, and tasted it, of the heavens and the power and the truth of our God, and we walked away from him, we would have walked away for real. Hmm? For real. So, no, they have no chance. It's just like any of you, you can say anything you want to about me because I know you really don't know me. But if you lived with me for four years and turned around and said, Mike, your right armpit stinks, I would say, yep, that person is. They told the truth. That's what they believe. Right? That would be the truth. If you said it right now, you don't know what I smell like. So it can't do anything. Your statement can't do anything because you really don't know. I can forgive you so easy because you don't know. But if you live with me for four years 
And then you told everybody my right armpit stinks because it really did. I'm going to be hurt. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be hurt because you let out my big secret, right? But I can forgive you because you don't know. You can always forgive a person when they don't really know. They don't really know, right? And guess what the truth is? Here's the beautiful part. We don't really know. By faith, we're believing. We don't really know. Come on now. That's why you can be forgiven of sins because you don't, you never really knew what you were actually doing, did you? You didn't know that you were working against a loving God. You did not know that you were aligning yourself with the demonic entities in hell itself. You did not know. You didn't know, so you can be forgiven. That's why somebody said, blaspheme the Holy Spirit. That's why when you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you cannot be forgiven. Because listen, to partake of the Holy Spirit is to know. When you partake of the Holy Spirit, you now know. You're, there are certain things you're not doing by faith anymore because you know. You will have tasted of the heavenly gift and the powers of the world to come. You know. And you cannot be forgiven if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You'll be in the same position as the fallen angels. Now you see it. Okay. Now, there was another. Wait a minute. Uh, let me go back to Doug was asking something. Let me go back here. Doug said, question. Jesus was very specific about hurting his children. Can you please expand on this? Lots of people I know use this scripture to bring judgment on people hurting children in Texas. No, Matthew eighteen six. Let's go to it. Let's go to it. Listen, you're gonna you're gonna hear you're gonna often hear things like this used. People will use anything they want, anything they can, right? When it comes to their love for something else, and you can't really blame them for that, right? Right. You can't really blame them because it hurts to see a child hurt. In Matthew 18, 6 says, But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones, which believe in me, it will be better for him that I'm also were hanged about his neck, and that it were drowned in the depths of the sea. Well, first of all, that word offend means to make stumble. That means to make somebody else stumble. To make somebody stumble. Here, here, here it is. If I, here's how you make somebody stumble. Let's say me and me and you guys were talking. All of a sudden, I said, "Well, you know what that word really means is make a sandwich," and I do so knowingly, right? And then you guys believe it. I just made you stumble. I'm making you believe something in error that will make you stumble. You do that to a young believer. You try to make a young believer stumble. You just kill them. You're gonna kill. You're gonna damage that pathway of faith. And it'd be better for you that you were not born at all. You see, see how, see, hurting someone physically, the Lord said, stop worrying about that stuff. But when you damage the path of somebody's faith, you have really, that's what the fallen angels did. That's exactly what they did. And so guess what? They're bound even right now. Hmm? So hopefully, hopefully that clears that up. So, but I'll, t I'll say it again. People use scripture when they're hurting for somebody else and they'll see things in their own context, right? They will. They'll see things in their own context. I just tend to like the truth of the word of God because it is so consistent. It really is. I trust it. I really do trust it. I really do. And God has given us insight and eyes beyond the error of mankind. See, when you want God's truth through Christ. That's what you're going to get. If you want something else, well, you're going to go look for that and get it too. You will have what you want. So you need to, everybody should always evaluate what they really want. I want the truth of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and of my Father. I want the truth. I do. I want his truth. I'm going to be pleasing to him. Because I honor him with everything I am. I do. He gave it all up for me. My goodness. Somebody says, uh, they, oh, yeah, you're explaining that. You're explaining that. So, okay. 
Okay, folks, what time is it? Oh, my goodness, are you serious? Are you serious? It's almost that time. It is. And this is a Saturday, which feels like, it, it didn't feel like a Saturday, does it? Not to me, it doesn't. Listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you guys again, listen, the fires in the USA. For the sake of this broadcast, I'm going to stay there. There's potential. They're going to be tremendous and horrendous. I cannot shake it. I cannot shake it. My heart is with those who are fighting these fires and being affected by these fires. And that this is, this is month number two. I've been praying with some guys about the fires. For some reason, this is about a couple months ago, I started watching these documentaries on fires, and I don't know why. I did was watching documentaries on these on the fires. Now, it's very difficult for me to watch anything, and normally I don't do it. I like documentaries on occasion. Not the civilian documentaries. I watch other types. Like, they're, they're real documentaries. Not for public TV, but they get through real facts. Anyway, I started watching these documentaries about fires. Right? You guys know I'm concerned about the degrading weather conditions the high winds and the storms and the fires and the floods that are coming. But for some reason, I was drawn to those who go into the forest fires. As soon as I did that, I'm watching these documentaries. And over and over again, I keep hearing a thousand trapped. A thousand trapped by fire surrounded. And it was almost like I can imagine a thousand people trapped by fire. So I'm drawn to these things like what happened? Is this something that happened to somebody or something? Or what is this? But I cannot let it go. And it's, it, when I was watching that documentary, I was totally in the first minute, right? I was totally involved in it. Here's the funny part. You ready? I didn't even start the documentary. And I was totally involved in these fires. Because fires, when they start consuming, they consume. You know, we've been blessed. You know, a lot of people have been blessed in America. We have been severely blessed. But the breakout of fires are going to be rough and very unforgiving. Two months ago, I think I spoke about that. Didn't I speak about that last month about the fires? I keep sneaking that term out there. But it's bothering me a lot. And I've been praying for firefighters and asking the Lord to clarify what is this. Because it's not like I have a word on the fires or anything. But they're, they are disturbing me. As though many more people are going to have to deal with it. Fires are unforgiving. They are unforgiving. And with all the areas that have given I was looking at a, at, a, at a model map of the red, red flag areas. This is not a public map. But do you not know every southern state was in the red, had a red flag? That's only, that's the month of uh, uh, the end of April. I see end of April and everybody will have a red flag according to this model. Despite all the rain California had, it's not enough in the ground to stop the fires that are coming. Lord have mercy. And then with the fires, I have a real heart for those who outside of the public eye risk their lives so people don't lose everything. Those are firefighters. They risk their lives so people don't lose everything. Emergency responders, police officers, they're doing their best. And I know and you know that the public is going to do nothing but criticize and blame them for the fires. For not, They're going to blame them for something. And with the death toll, people are going to become cold. I can't 
it's hard on me when a person goes through loss. It's very hard on me when people cannot see the people, the deeds of the folks who really love them. I can relate to that. I kind of secretly care for people a lot, right? I don't want people to know that I'm the unseen hand in their life doing this, that, or doing the other. I don't want people to ever know it's me. But one time, one time, and I never said anything, a person looked me in the face, and they were so angry, and told me nobody ever does anything. And they looked right at me and said, not even you. Not even you. I didn't say a word. I didn't say a word. Back then, I was not as uh, reserved as I am now, but I didn't say a word. Here's the deal, though. Back then, we paid for people's homes. I had 10 families I took care of. I mean, took care of them every single month. They didn't know where it was coming from. But we selected them based on some very rough conditions. Start taking care of these people. And and uh, we were helping to, you know, just making sure the kids were educated and aware of things, right, to, to kind of enhance the life so they would in turn enhance somebody else's life. And one of the people's lives I personally enhanced, a trouble came to that specific part of the neighborhood. And I involved myself, which I never should have done. Made it know I was there for any other reason than an official type thing. And, and the person looked at me and said, you don't do anything either. Now, now, internally, I'm telling myself, well, this person doesn't know. Right? Person doesn't know. They don't know. And so that's why they said what they said. I've heard that from so many couples. There are couples out there. One person will look to the other and say, you don't do anything. That's why I don't like, that's exactly why I don't like holidays. To set up a day where you love a person one day out of the year, but if you don't do anything in that one day out of the year, they'll discount everything else you did. That's why I don't like holidays. I don't like that commercial stuff. Because it gives people an excuse to hate others. It does. But, it never discouraged me from helping those people out, from a continuation and expanding the things I used to do personally. It never, never, I never take away from that. I just quickly realized that when people don't see acts of love, they'll say they're not loved. What they don't realize, God has appointed someone to love just about everybody. Just because you don't see it. Never say somebody does not love you. Don't ever say that. Don't say that. And when you're a couple, never let that thought enter into your mind. Focus your minds on what you can do for the other person. Don't worry about what they can do for you. Don't do that. Don't do that. You be that vessel of love. That's all you have to say. Don't, don't worry about what's coming back. Let your love be genuine, just like the Father's. We cannot give anything back to God. We cannot. We can't. What can we do for the Most High? What? Somebody name anything that we can do for the Most High to enhance His existence. Can anybody name anything? Name anything I can do to pay Jesus back for dying for me at the cross. Somebody name something. I can't do anything, can I? I cannot do a thing. And so I honor him. Is death a high price to ask? No, it is not. If it comes to that, so be it. But he loved you, didn't he? God loved you all. Guess what that means? If I'm going to do something to honor Christ, it's going to have to be toward you and for you. Do you hear me? To honor the Lord is to do something for you. 
That's all I can do. No wonder it says, do unto everybody as you would do unto the Lord. Right? Do your good deeds in secret that your Father may reward you openly. That is to say, do your good deeds in truth. I don't advertise good. Well, I remember one time somebody said, well, this was early in COT. They said, well, COT only prays the Lord's Prayer. There's nobody getting saved in COT. And I believe that year we had 240,000 saved. Most of the people who said that they came to Christ for the first time through COT. And that was more than 12 years, 13, 14 years ago. But the person was angry, I guess. And they said that. Maybe. Maybe. And a lot of people over time have said different things not knowing what actually happens. May just don't know. But I'm not one to say, well, we did this and we did that. Because if Satan can ever make you say what you have done, he's got you. That's what he wants. He wants you to get up there and say, oh, no, we didn't. We did this and we did that. We did that. Because as soon as you tell what you're doing, he's going to go and attack where you have poured your heart into. I'm telling you what I know. He, Satan cannot, he cannot initiate knowledge to other people unless you initiate it first. You all better write that one down. Satan cannot initiate information to other people unless you initiate it first. If you release, if you tell something out of your mouth, Satan can use it. Whatever you don't tell, it doesn't matter. Somebody said, well, what if Satan can read your mind? So what? He can't do anything with it. He cannot do anything unless I initiate it. And the only way I'm going, the reason why we initiate that is through frustration or trying to prove something to somebody else. In other words, we defy the word of God when we do that. And Satan can run with it. But I listen, I know for if you don't initiate it, he can't use it. He can't. Have you ever been have you ever been talked to a person and they try to get you to say something? And then you get away from the subject and they come right back around and try to get you to say something. Right? Now if you don't say anything, they can't use it. But as soon as you open your mouth, they use it against you and everything else you're trying to do. Come on now, somebody knows that. Somebody has been through that. And I'm telling you why that happens. If, because take note, Satan can use anybody in a moment of weakness. And so what he'll do is get somebody who's irritated, aggravated, angry, or whatever the case is, and try to get you to initiate information, normally through you defending yourself or some action that you did. And as soon as you do that, he's going to use that to confuse other people about your life and cause confusion and division everywhere else. But if you don't use it, he can't go a step further. It is so funny. The other person shuts down. They shut down when they cannot elicit that thing from you or get that thing from you. I say they can't do anything with it. You'll know they're trying to get information to use against you or to shut down what you're doing or to have it obstructed, whatever the case is, when they continue to come back to the same thing. So when you hold your peace, you defeat Satan in that conversation. Remember that. Remember that. Remember that. If you can remember that small thing, you're going to save yourself air. You will. You really will. Okay. I'll take one last question. And, and forgive me, my mouth started going, and, and then uh, I lost everything. Are the places that got 12 inches of snow, and if other places are going to experience the same thing? Well, they, anybody in line with this storm, right? Anybody who's at uh, uh, that specific altitude in which the moisture held its temperature, they, they're they would receive the same thing. And we have some more frontal systems inbound. My hope 
is that some of these uh, uh, southern anomalies will begin to move northward. If that happens, it's going to just cancel that out. It'll be rain. But listen, it's going to be a lot of moisture. If not snow, it's going to be water. It's going to be water. Okay? If not snow, it's going to be water. But the same storm, the same storm is, is more snow is expected. So expect more store, uh, more snow. You can trust your forecast at this moment. There are no high pressure disruptors uh, around the scene right now. So take that, you know, take the highest form of caution. Take the highest form. What we have is a continual. This is simply what what California is experiencing, and all these states are experiencing is nothing more than the frontal systems altering just a little bit. Right? We have a part of the Earth. That's changing because of the influence of the sun due to the tilt of the earth. That's causing massive changes in the jet stream, right? So we're going to see more anomalistic changes like that in weather big time, especially uh, this summer, especially this summer, this spring and summer. So, folks, get ready for the water because the water potential is going to be high in certain regions, but it's going to be an absolute desert in other regions. And with it, just like the Lord said, he said something, I'll say it again. I said it here in COT. I want to bring your mind back to it again. He said, nations in distress with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring. Now, when it says the seas and the waves roaring, that's a telltale remark to weather itself. What have we been seeing an increase of? Weather. Higher waterfall potentials. Higher wind speed potentials. Higher storm discharges concerning lightning, right? All sorts of anomalies. They have a new name for a hurricane because they had to change the classification for higher winds, for more expansive storms. They have two names for very large thunderstorms. Remember I told you that a weather system would cover the whole of the USA? It would go from the northern part of the U.S. all the way to the south. It would go from the east to the west. You remember that? Now we have storms that pass through one storm that covers the whole U.S. Pretty soon, and now this is from north to south. Imagine when a thunderstorm comes through, a, a one cumulonimbus cloud that covers the entirety of the U.S. just about. That's going to be disastrous. Imagine when microbursts, and pilots know about this, microbursts become the normal thunderstorms. That's going to happen too. So in other words, it won't be a standard thunderstorm. It'll be the same forces found in a microburst, but it'll be the size of a thunderstorm and the duration of a thunderstorm and the consistency of a thunderstorm. That's going to be devastating because in a microburst, when it starts to rain and that those high winds go straight down, it takes the oxygen out of the air. So sometimes people can't even breathe. The winds are going to increase on the seas, causing the seas and the coastlines to be very unsafe. Very unsafe. You'll see telltale marks of that this year. They will say we've had the highest wind speeds on record. They came up with that term duratio to explain uh, 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 straight line winds. Listen to me, folks. As high pressures reach higher in the atmosphere, and they will, through atmosphere compression, far more density in the upper atmospheres than ever before, right? Those isobars, which are the, the, the small lines between a low pressure system and a high pressure system, those tight lines in between, they dictate, you know, the speed of the wind. They're going to be so tightly packed this year. They're going to have to call them something else. The ratio is not going to do, right? It's just not going to do. So you're talking about straight line winds with wind speeds of a tornado. And not just a little bitty tornado, but a bad tornado. Straight line winds with the force of a tornado spanning a couple of states. Two or three states long. So listen to me. Can you imagine sustained wind speeds of 148 miles an hour, straight line winds going right through two states? This is what everything is converting into. And as the upper atmosphere continues to, to have more and more density, we're going to see higher and higher wind speeds. Everything is being compressed, right? It's kind of like, like a balloon. 
when you can press a balloon or put air in it and then you start squeezing it on all sides, everything is tight until one day, poof. Right? Somebody says, uh, Mike, why don't you stop praying before the end of broadcast? Actually, on air, right, on air, when I'm talking sometimes, or, or I do it before I get on air, and I certainly do it after I get off air, but I'll throw you guys in it if you want to. There's no problem with that. No problem with that at all. No problem with that at all. You, you guys remember the Lord's Prayer? I used to say the Lord's Prayer because it's the perfect prayer. We had people upset about the Lord's Prayer, so I prayed it even more. But to stop, to, to, to not get into that back and forth thing, right? I began to do things outside of the timing of what was expected. I was simply obedient. Simply obedient. And when that took place, then a lot of wolves unzipped. Lots of wolves unzipped. And when they unzipped, because they couldn't have it their way, right? Uh, you know, they, they kind of other things happen. But some innocent people, of course, always get caught up with wolves. They do. They do. But listen to me. Prayer for me is not something for a show. But that's not what prayer is. Prayer is my conversation with the Most High. That's what it is. Prayer is going to be effective with or without somebody's knowledge, just so you know that. Anybody is welcome to join into those prayers, right? Anybody is. But I just want you guys to know that about prayer. If you guys want prayer at the beginning of the show, we can do that. If you want it at the end, we can do that. If I'm inspired to do it for a specific reason and comes out from time to time, I will do that. But I don't start a show without prayer, a certain type of prayer. Yeah. Hmm? And after the show, I often pray for many of the comments you guys leave. I often do that. Sometimes you would not want to hear what I'm praying about. I can tell you that now. I'm just telling you. See, if prayer is real, then I'm not going to make up any fake words. When I'm praying for people, it's important that I do that in my secret place because suppose I'm praying for something and somebody doesn't want a fact known and they didn't tell a soul and nobody knows until I bring it up. Now, nobody will know until they react, right? But there are people out there with health conditions. There are people out there fighting addictions. There are people out there fighting urges. There are people that keep failing because of the Internet. And I pray about very real things, what the Father shows me, right? Also, we had some operatives in COT. And every time I prayed, right, then they would go back and start talking about prayer in a very negative way, or not saying prayer was bad, but to alter the words of the word of God, right, changing subtleties here and there, causing confusion. So I just said, I'll pray before I get on there. And because nobody heard it, they're going to think not to say anything, though I still pray, still accomplished. Prayer is powerful, and I'll say it again. Whether somebody knows about a prayer or not, it's not going to change a thing. It's not going to change a thing. But that's up to you guys. If you want to pray before a show, then say it. That's all. Just say it. That's all you got to do. If you have a specific prayer, note it. I see it. I see those often. Somebody has uh, somebody in a hospital here in COT they were asking people to pray for. But never get upset because you think that somebody is not praying for you. And never forget that your Messiah is praying for you, too. And he has power to back up everything he would pray about. How about that? Hmm? Remember that. I'm never hurt by somebody not praying for me because the Messiah prays for me and he prays for you, too. Prayer is real, and it should never be something for show. In the Bible, it says, don't think you're going to be heard for your many words like the hypocrites. He said, but when you pray, go in your secret pray place. Go in your secret place and pray, right? He said, don't go in the synagogues, 
thinking you're going to be heard for your many words. Prayer is sacred. It is very sacred. But let's go ahead and face it. You have a lot of people that play with it. They want verbal confirmation of something just to have a comfort or for it to be like something else. Prayer is real. It is very real. It is very intimate. When we pray about something, let it be for something collective that we can all agree with. Right? Let us have a purpose, a clear purpose. A clear one. Now, if anybody ever wants to join me pre-show in prayer, Channel Zero is where I do that at. You'll hear a lot on that channel. Channel Zero. That's in the media player. You go to the media player of COT and select Channel Zero. There's no music on that channel. No music. And in the mornings, I will be using that channel for some of my uh, AM antics. Not a show, just kind of leaving the mic on, like an open mic thing. I'll be using it for that, right? If you heard it for a week, you will know what I do every all the time, just about. You would. You would. Hmm? But listen, prayer is a, it's a real thing. It's, it's not for show, though. It's not for show. I like the question I like that. So Watchman has a question. Let me see. Let me go back. I missed that. Start running my yappers again. I'm in COT now, guys. Hold on just a minute. Let me get the right uh, thing here. Go back. What a watcher hat. Watchman 88. Mike, what do you... Oh, my goodness gracious. What do you think we will hit the point of no return with the binary system? Arcs all this one believes that. The point of no return for the binary system, the effects have already begun. Here's the deal with the binary system. Here's the deal. They can afford not to talk about a binary system so long so long as the constellation is not visible yet, right? When you guys learn of a brand-new constellation that becomes visible, that's when you know the influence of this secondary system is already about, what I would say, about 20%, 20% upon our solar system. Right now, it's about, I'd say it's about 5%, right? About 15 years ago, it was 0%, 0%. Now, I'm doing this in relationship to things. So, right now, this 5%, in a very short time, is going to turn to 40%. Very short time. That 40% is going to turn to 100% in an even shorter time. Because... It, it speeds up as it gets close to us, which means the effects are going to be exponential. That's what it means. When you see an ungodly constellation, an evil constellation, and it will be in a very evil time, which is right on your calendars. When you see that constellation, they will announce it. At that point, you'll know. You'll know. You'll know that that binary system is on its way. And from that constellation, right, after they see that, you will begin to see two distinct objects in the heavens. Two distinct ones. From that point, uh, you better have made up your mind. Once you see it this time, it's not going to be like the days, you know, in the days of old, they saw it, and they still had time. They didn't know what it was, and it troubled people, and society started falling apart, and it took time to get to us, not this time. Once you see that constellation, it's going to be different. Why? Because they've already mapped. They've already mapped the constellations back in the time when it was reported back then. They've been using a massive amount of, of archaeological finds, computing power and everything else to map the time of the arrival of this system. They already know about it. They used the Bible. They used every ancient text they could find. And they're doing so to map the stars according to what people saw at specific times to make the model more accurate. And according to that model, the heavens were nothing like they are now. That's why the pyramids uh, don't quite align with, they don't align with what we see now, Right? Um, there are certain things they haven't presented to the public which throws off 
the public's timing and their blatant lies they have thrown out there to the public because, you know, they, they like going by people's assumptions, right? They like that. So hear me on this. They, they, have, a, they have whole organizations devoted to timing. They do. Right? They do. And don't let Japan's new facility fool you. Don't let that fool you. Uh, CERN is absolutely being used for some major things. Right? Quantitative or, or uh, um, these quantum computers, that is not the thing anymore. Just, just so you know that. They've gone far beyond that. They have. They, they honestly have. They're utilizing. They're in this phase of utilizing this high-tech stuff to make the model as accurate as possible. And you won't believe the technology they've used to employ this. Essentially, they're looking for the right date to do what they have to do, and they have to be precise. They have to be very precise. They want to know everything. Everything. Just so you know that. Just so you know that. They want to know everything. Is that in part sacrifices? Is is what? Is that in part their sacrifices cut off? Could be. Could be. No, it's a new constellation. Uh, Solo, it's a new constellation. It's not a known constellation. They will announce it because amateur astronomers are going to find it. It's not a. It's, it's gonna not be up there at one moment, and then the next moment it will. It's almost like an optical plane, right? Once you get within our heliosphere, it's almost like an optical plane. Everything outside of that region is highly distorted, where you really would pick it up unless it has a, a specific luminous. And so once it gets, once it penetrates that that the heliosphere and that optical plane I'm going to call it it takes on its shape like everything else right now the the when we see this it'll be because something has moved out of the way that's been in position for many thousands of years I would assume uh, and it's going to be shifting out of the way we're at the edge of it now and so even there's there's a known distortion they can see right now and so when it totally moves out of the way the brightness will come in and people will be able to see that light from the earth and at that point, well, it'll be it'll be good. But people will see a brand new constellation. I'm telling you what that means before it ever gets here, because when it gets here, they're going to come up with a brand new explanation. And many of you are going to believe their explanation, because they'll speak in the language of known science, not Mike's riddles. Somebody says what? At what point can you test about that? Somebody says, Mike, teach me rightly divide the word. You know what? To rightly divide the word comes from the Messiah himself. How is that done? That means, listen, because somebody had this question the other day. They said, well, well how do you read the Bible? You ready? As you read the Bible, don't read all of it in one day. Read it and apply it to your life. And go live it. Go walk it out. Right? Read some more and apply it to your life. Gain experience with the scriptures. That way, don't just read it and keep living your life like you used to. No. If you believe in the word of God, then live your life by the word of God. Not following a bunch of rules, no. Like when the Lord, the Lord has advisements on what you should do given certain encounters. So just don't read it. Go live your life by it. Interact with people according to it. That's how you gain insight into many things, right? People who know it by knowledge, they have no idea how to utilize it. They can explain everything and can do nothing. They still get frustrated. They still get angry, right? They still wrestle with things. As you read the Word of God, if you start walking it out, you're going to have actual change in your life. And again, it's not about following a bunch of rules. No, it's about you choosing to walk like your family. How about that? Because God wants you as his child. So then be like your father. 
Start walking out those things. You're meant to do that. That's why you believe in Christ. You're actually meant to do some pretty fascinating things. And you're meant to be able to live your life just like Christ advises. That's the power that lies dormant in many people. And some people, that's the very thing they reject because they choose the world. Right? But walk those scriptures out so you know like, what they are, what they are in and out. Right? Have experience with them. Be an experiencer of the Father's word. Do that. Okay, folks, we're at the end. We're at the end. We're at the end. But uh, this weekend, we might have a midnight hour. Is that okay with you guys? We might have one. Listen, when you guys see an evil constellation, when you see a brand new constellation, right, uh, just know it's out there. You already know the. You already know what's happening. Because when you see it, I can almost guarantee you, I will not be able to say the simple things I'm saying right now. That often happens. Just let you know that. We'll talk about other things, sure. But I will not touch the consolation. I won't do it. Once people see it, I can't touch that conversation. Okay? I can't can't do that. Now, nobody else is telling you about seeing another consolation. And I am. And once it's here, I'm not going to talk about that. Somebody says, why? Because if I start talking about it, then, Right? And everybody's going to say, ooh, that's the person who talked about it back then, so let me go see where. And they're going to start treating COT as something other than what it actually is. We're, we're not here to do the fortune-telling thing. That's not why we're here. We're not here to attract people because sometimes we say things that may come to pass. That's not why we're here, right? We're here in an effort by way of a council, which is the decision in the minds of many people who love the Lord to assist in the gospel of Jesus Christ in this world. To not be restrained by media, by money, by any of those factors, but to go forward in freedom with the Holy Spirit with what the Lord would desire us to do for other people. That's what we're here for. That's what we're here. And we can facilitate assistance in many different ways for all of God's people and his operations. That's what we're here for. And those things are being established and bought to full fruition, including digital support for churches around the globe. So that means I have to learn the new protocols that work with AI. And any of you guys who are out there in the world, you're, you're, uh, you're doing your thing. Uh, well, there are three languages you're going to have to learn. And some of the new protocols and the IPV standards. And then in this year, you're going to have to learn that this year, right? So you can be up to speed with that so that you can work within the AI, that AI protocol. At any rate, I want to say God bless all of you. God bless all of you. And, uh, oh, we are, we're going to try this, guys. Since 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 we we can't quite get one patent, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to make a device that will be direct to you guys, right? Now, I'm not selling this device. I'm going to be giving it away, giving it away. So, but I want, as we, as I build them, I want you guys to try it. Just try this device out. I think we'll be, uh, now, Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, I can't give it to everybody. I'm going to have to pray for everybody I give it to. Before I give it to you, I'm going to have to pray because uh, everybody cannot have this device. No, 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 no. No, everybody can't have it. It's not, some, it's not a toy. It's a, it's a device for, for some good things, right? But I want that in people's hands so they can do something, too, that they weren't able to do before. Plus, I, I need a testing team to start testing all this stuff. And some of you guys I'm going to have to grab. Two of the beta testers aren't just simply, they're, they're, uh, 
that they're in the wrong country for testing so quickly. Wrong country now. There's certain things you can't test anymore. So uh, we'll do that. But, again, I'm going to have to pray behind everybody who would desire to test with those things because you never know who's out there, right? And COT has already had an issue with a person who took some things and uh, made it their own. I did something by trust, not protecting it, right? Did it by trust. This person replicated a, a product that did not work like ours, but they, they, they kind of took it and tried to replicate it. And if they got it out there, they got in trouble because they couldn't replicate, they couldn't replicate all of it and the standards weren't there. Shame on them. They shouldn't have done it. But the point is, people steal ideas all the time. Right? They do. They steal ideas all the time. All the time. Expect that. In this case, if somebody stole it, then we have about, you know, we got about 12 months to make another one that they can't uh, stop the functionality on. But I'm interested in, in uh, the power requirements of your small devices, right? I'm interested in knowing what traffic is on your networks. Think about that. I want to know every single piece of traffic on my networks here. So somebody is looking at my network. I want to know who it is. If somebody sniffed or sent a packet in my ping my network, I want to know who it is. I don't want to know the IP. I want to know who it is. I build things like that a lot because I want to know everything about everybody who would dare look into the networks of COT. I do. To power it, to see it, to see the truth, and then to work with it. I like to see that too. Right? So that the data going back and forth is unobstructed. Like our databases, they had to be backed up on multiple machines, not just one machine, but multiple machines. So that if any one machine goes down or any one place is hit, it can reassemble and stay operational. Like you guys have been chatting on a database that's housed on a multitude of computers. And in the chat, our chats, right? Right now in the COT chat room, you guys are chatting with each other. But when you send a message, it is sent out to numerous computers. Not text, but numerous computers, right? It is parsed, sent out tore to pieces, and then when it's recalled to present to everybody else, it comes from a different set of computers that is reassembled and then shown to everybody, right? So if anybody ever took a database, it doesn't matter what they can decrypt or encrypt, they just won't have anything. They'll have a bunch of nonsense and blank characters. You have to have the key to all those computers to put everything back together effectively. Plus, it is incredibly fast. And have you guys noticed it does not use resources on your personal computers? Have you noticed that? It does not. It only uses a few graphical resources of your device. The rest is a, a server overhead. Have you noticed that? You go to other chat rooms, right? The overhead builds up and slows down your device. COT doesn't do that. Most people throw everything on your device. COT didn't do that. We absorb everything because you don't have to throw everything on the client device you can distribute that even in the wires in between the packets you just have to have a good multiplex strategy right you have to have some good strategy to take it apart put it back together and present it using minimal uh, cpu usage so in COT, it you hardly uses anything out of your devices. And to be honest with you, Steve, 37 was, was the motivation in doing that. There's still some work to be done, but 37 is the motivation in doing that. So that anybody from any country can utilize um, the COT data points with no problem. No? no problem. So that's what I'm interested in. So that we have computers that do real computing and not just a bunch of sneaky stuff to make money. Folks, i got to go. Somebody says I have an iOS 8 and I don't think the radio chip is accessible. No, they're not going to readily let anybody access that radio chip, but uh, they're just not going to do that. Can it be accessed? If they built it, it can be accessed. They can. Are you supposed to, if it's not your phone, no. If it's not your phone, you're not supposed to do that. 
right? Trust me, there are people. There's a, when I first made a comment about using that radio, that made some people nervous. Do you know I got a lot of emails? I got com I had companies inquiring about that, and they would give me the company policy and they'd be, well, you can't do that to this. Not have to write back saying that's not what we're doing. Anyway, they thought we were gonna. They thought we were gonna. Uh, Given an instructional thing or software that would uh, hack a person's phone. No, that's not what we're doing. This has an actual EULA, right? And it will check certain IDs and things. In other words, they try to stop it. They didn't want that to happen. Do you guys know why? It's their secondary transport system. That's why. They use that radio chip to send data you don't even know about. That's why. Anyway, folks, God bless and keep all of you. I'm going to see you guys next time right here at COT. And when I'm hanging out in the chat sometimes, um, it'd be a good time to ask some of the questions you guys have now. It'd be a good conversation for the chat room when I'm in there from time to time. And I will be spending more time in the chat room with you guys, especially with you guys. Right? God bless you guys. Listen, at any time if the player turns on after midnight, that means it's a midnight hour. That's what it means. Okay? God bless you guys. I'm going to see you next time right here at COT. God bless.